feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did the fail her. Exactly. We're supposed it to was moved another on from that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning, I'm Peter Cardwell. You're watching and listening to Talk TV. Coming up, urgent action is needed to protect free speech and British democracy, according to a new government report. I'll be speaking to its author, Dame Sarah Khan, in a few minutes' time. Fears China hacked your details. 40 million voters' information has been accessed by the hostile state. And Kensington Palace has released a statement thanking well-wishers, but asking the public to give the Princess of Wales a bit of space. You can give us a call on any of the topics we're talking about today, 0344 499 1000. Text me, 87222, or tweet us on X, at Talk TV. But first, let's get the news headlines with Emily Rose Adams. Good morning. MPs are set to be briefed about the cyber threat posed by China, while some individuals will be told about direct threats against them. Sources close to the matter have said that the Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden is expected to make a statement to Parliament later, in which he'll also outline that the personal data of more than 40 million voters was accessed last year. Well, former head of the Defence Select Committee, Tobias Elwood, has told Talk TV we must work with our allies before it's too late. We've all got to do the same thing. Otherwise, China is able to exploit the differences that we have. And that is the big challenge that we face. We need a China strategy. We need to recognize that this is China's century, that uh, in the next few decades, it could easily challenge or indeed overtake the United States militarily, economically, technologically as well. Four men have been charged with terrorism in Russia following a concert hall attack that killed 137 people. Three of the men were marched into a court in Moscow, while a fourth was pushed in a wheelchair. Russia claimed Ukrainian involvement, however, Kyiv says those allegations are absurd. Islamic State has since said it was behind the attack on the Crocus City Hall on Friday. Well, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, former commanding general in the U.S. Army, has told us it's highly likely ISIS-K were behind it. This is not something that they just popped onto the scene. The U.S. and U.K. provided warnings to Russia uh, back a couple of weeks ago of possible terrorist attacks. So to me, these kind of things give more credibility to ISIS-K's claim that they are, in fact, responsible. The Home Office has launched a social media campaign in Vietnam to deter migrants from coming to the UK illegally. The campaign will use adverts on Facebook and YouTube to target people in the Southeast Asian country who may be considering making illegal journeys to the UK. An increasing proportion of small boat migrants are Vietnamese and they are one of the top 10 nationalities for migrants crossing the channel illegally. It's emerged Britain's leading universities now get most of their fees from foreign students as they become increasingly reliant on overseas money to stay afloat. Dozens of unis, including Oxford and Cambridge, only get a minority of their income from British students, with some prestigious institutions getting more than three quarters of their fees from abroad. Well, universities insist the ability to attract rising numbers from overseas is a sign of success. And top scientists in Switzerland have announced they'll soon look into whether invisible ghost particles actually exist. Those behind the major CERN Hadron Collider project, which will hold experiments to look into the mystery of ghost particles, which could help us greatly advance our understanding of the true nature of the universe. They say their new technology is a thousand times more sensitive than previous devices. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazan Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
Hello, it's a wet start to the week. We're going to be seeing rain pretty much everywhere spreading northwards across the UK, although parts of East Anglia and the southeast just about staying dry with some brightness there later and feeling fairly mild with the southerly winds there. But everywhere else, it's going to feel cool under the cloud and the rain as it pushes up across parts of uh, the rest of England and Wales up into southern Scotland and Northern Ireland. Some wintry showers are likely across eastern parts of Scotland. And as we head into tonight, and that wet weather continues its journey further northwards, hitting cold air, there will be significant snow likely for central and eastern parts of Scotland where the Met Office have a warning above 300 metres up to 20 centimetres likely and above 200 metres up to around 2 or 5 centimetres. So some disruption to travel likely by Tuesday morning. England and Wales though will be mostly dry except across the north and west where there will be spells of rain. Then through tomorrow we continue to see the rain and hill snow move and clear away from Scotland. It will come brighter there. Some rain edging up towards Northern Ireland and Wales, parts of the West Country will see rain at first heading towards areas of the Midlands and central southern England later in the day. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning, welcome back. I'm Peter Cardwell and you're with Talk TV. TV. Today we're asking about a new report which says there is now a dangerous climate of harassment and censorship with 76% of people not expressing their opinion out of fear. Are you one of them? Give us a call, let me know. 0344 499 1000, text me at 7222 with the word talk in your text or tweet, tweet us on X. At Talk TV. Well, joining me today to run through the top stories is writer and commentator Candace Holdsworth. Great to have you with us. Really, really worrying. We're going to talk to Sarah Khan in just a second, but she's talking about a new phrase I think we all need to learn freedom restricting harassment. It's not just people at the top of society, it's all over the place that people are being told they can't say certain things, Candace. Yes, I know. And, you know, I mean, you, of course, you see it at the extreme end where you get threats of political violence and, and intimidation. But I think there are milder forms of it as well. I mean, you see sort of mobbing and bullying behavior that happens on social media. Even the really low level stuff, self-censorship. People yes. not saying things because they fear in a workplace, for example, that sure. they'll be canceled. Yes, and I think it also fil filters down to the schools as well. I mean, what you're seeing is a generation that's sort of grown up online and teachers are saying that they, they're very afraid of expressing their opinion. Yeah. You know, rather than being able to just say, okay, this is what I think, they kind of find people who they know will agree with them. Yes. And it's something that we have to really... And that's a form of self-censorship. It is. Well. Yeah. We have to cultivate in schools kids being able to self-express and respect different opinions. It's yes, so important. Exactly. Well, Candice, we'll come back to you throughout the morning, but I want to talk to the uh, report's author because urgent action is needed to protect the resilience of British democracy and social cohesion, according to the new government report uh, we've been discussing. And joining me now is its author and the independent government advisor for social cohesion and resilience, Dame Sarah Khan. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. Uh, I've been reading uh, all about this yesterday and today, Sarah, and the thing that really worries me most of all is what you've written about in your article in the Daily Telegraph today. A specific form of harassment, which I refer to, you refer to, as freedom-restricting harassment, is not just affecting politicians and high-profile individuals, it's having a negative impact on people from many backgrounds and professions, not least teachers, police officers, journalists, civic society activists, and those working in the arts and local councillors. Tell us about your findings, Sarah, on this really, what I think, is a very important report. So I, my review it looks at contemporary threats to social cohesion and democratic resilience. And one of those threats is what I have termed freedom restricting harassment. Uh, and by that, I mean when people experience or witness threatening, intimidatory, abusive harassment, either online and or offline, which is then intended to make people and institutions to censor or self-censor out of fear. And as you, as you've rightly addressed, you know, over the last couple of months and even in the last couple of years, there has been a lot of commentary and concern about how parliamentarians, uh, public people in public life are often on the front line of receiving this abuse. But my report shows for the first time this is a much broader phenomenon, which is poisoning the lifeblood of our political and civic life. So we carried out some polling, for example, which showed that over three quarters of the population have refrained from sharing a personal opinion in public out of fear of receiving freedom-restricting harassment. 
harassment, nearly half of the public, having witnessed others experiencing this freedom restricting harassment, have then chosen to self-censor because, again, of fear of receiving freedom restricting harassment. I was shocked by the fact that 27% of respondents to our poll have described what, the, what, is, um, um, uh, what they describe as life-altering consequences of freedom restricting harassment. So the fact that there are people in our country who've had to move house, who've had to take additional security measures, who have had to change or, or they've even lost their job because of this type of abuse. So it's, it's deeply concerning. And when we ask the British public, well, how concerned are you? about freedom restricting harassment, seven in 10 of the public were deeply concerned that it was restricting their ability to live and speak freely in our democracy, that it was censoring their, the way they were able to live their lives personally and professionally. But they were also concerned that it was a, having a negative impact on the way we are able to live together as a diverse democracy, and also that it was going to restrict people from contributing to public life in the, in the future. So as I say in my report, this is a toxic and insidious threat to our democracy, to freedom of expression, and to many of the democratic rights and freedoms that our country has fought for for centuries, which we must do more to protect. We are the home of free speech here at Talk TV, and you can say what you want within the law, Sarah. Where is this coming from? Well, that's a very interesting question, and we've not looked at what are the motivating factors what is causing and driving this phenomenon in our country? I mean, I suspect it's a whole range of different views um, from having spoken to a wide range of victims and having looked at all the evidence collectively. I suspect, obviously, social media has coarsened public life. It's coarsened up the way we talk with each other. Dialogue now seems to be very much a dirty word where we don't want to engage in, in meaningful dialogue, even with people whose views we may disagree with. That is something that's really important, that we don't stay in our own echo chambers. Um, engaging and different opinions really matter. But I also think there are more deeper rooted um, problems. I think obviously in a cost of living crisis, people feel resentment, people feel anger, they have grievances about the way their life is, 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 is currently um, is at the moment. Um, there's a lot of um, data that shows there's a dis disillusionment with democracy. People feel there's a lack of trust with politicians, with political parties, they don't trust the press, for example. So all of these wider factors I think is contributing to this kind of sense of, well, if I don't like your political opinion, if I don't like your particular job or profession, um, it justifies me to behave in a certain way. And of course it doesn't. But I think this is a much more deeper rooted societal problem that we've got to get better at addressing. There is absolutely no doubt that, there, that what you say is right. But there is kind of the elephant in the room here as well, as they're not, Sarah Khan in that Islamist intimidation of many people. You were, of course, this report was basically prompted by the Batley Grammar School affair. I, I wanna ask you about Islamist intimidation in our society, because that is a major threat. The security services deal with that, the police deal with that, but it's more insidious and it's more widespread, isn't it? There's, there's no doubt that there are people who are experiencing Islamist intimidation. Yes, I um, you know, evidence a whole range of cases. I mean, one of the cases that I demonstrate is how Muslims themselves are at the forefront of receiving that intimidation. I mean, I remember speaking to an imam, for example, um, a scientist, and he's also an academic. Um, and because Islamists in this country did not like his view um, and did not support his moderate beliefs, um, and because he was a vocal critic of Islamist extremism, he regularly received death threats. I mean, this imam had to have 18 months of police protection. And I remember him saying to me that he had to have his children cowering under the kitchen table because they were so fearful that Islamists were coming, going to attack him. Um, so, you know, of course, there, there's a real sense of Islamist extremists intimidating and threatening people. But my report goes wider. It shows that there's a real challenge of far-right extremists as well. I mean, I spoke to counsellors who were telling me that they were being stalked and threatened by far-right extremists and were feeling very, very fearful by that. But the, the interesting um, thing around freedom restricting harassment is it is not just extremists who are engaging in this activity. It is a much broader section of society who feel it is legitimate and justifiable to uh, threaten people, to engage well, well, in intimidation. Let's get into that, Sarah, because I want to ask you, we've talked about the sort of high-level, very dangerous threats, harassment, intimidation. Um, I, I, we've talked a little bit about that, but I want to talk about the more low-level stuff, the workplaces, the places where people feel they can't say things. Just tell me how that manifests itself. Some people watching this and listening to this will say, I know how it manifests itself, but what did you find in your report? So I think it definitely feeds into this wider climate that I'm talking about. But I also think it's really important that we are very clear about what freedom restricting harassment is, because, of course, 
there is already legislation to deal with harassment and there's of course there's censorship what freedom restricting harassment what's so unique about it it's when harassment quite extreme forms of harassment then lead to censorship so it's that phenomenon together that makes it really quite insidious so what if people for example are sharing a particular opinion or, um, you know, so for example, let me give you the arts and cultural sector. There's been quite a lot of surveys uh, recently that have shown that people who work in the arts and cultural sector, 45% have experienced intimidation, bullying, harassment, and ostracization just because of maybe some of the controversial yet legitimate nature of their work. As a result of that, around 44% of, of, of those people who've experienced that abuse have then changed their product or their programs or their plans, just showing how because of a direct result of that harassment, they have then changed their, their product because of what they are doing. Well, and is this is the tail wagging the dog, isn't it, Sarah? This is the tail wagging the dog, isn't it, Sarah? We have a, a small minority, well, of people, and, and you, I mean, you've talked about the 76% of people who have had to change their opinions. And I just, I just think this is incredibly worrying. I know this was prompted as well by the Batley Grammar School affair with the uh, teacher who showed the image, the cartoon of, the, uh, of, of Muhammad. I wonder, I know you interviewed him for your report. How, with, within the realms of what you can say on national television, how is he doing? So, I mean, just to be very clear before I answer that question, Peter, my report was commissioned actually before what happened at Batley, just as a matter of clarification. Okay, sure. So, yes, yes, I, I have spoken to him um, and I'm in regular contact with him. And, I mean, strangely enough, um, today, Peter, is is three years to the day when he was forced into hiding. Um, as I show in my report, he is currently suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. At the time of the incident, he was suicidal, not solely just because of what happened to him, but actually because of the failure of the local agencies who he thought would have helped him. And that compounded his suicidal thoughts. And you know, let, let's remember what happened to him. This was an individual, a teacher who had taught this lesson Four times previously, he was just doing what any other individual was doing. He was delivering. And this delivering is the fear that so system. many people have, Sarah, isn't it? That if you do something that falls foul of a, a mob, essentially, and there were a mob who intimidated him, you will be hung out to dry by the authorities and by the structures that are meant to protect you, that are meant to protect freedom of speech, freedom of thought in this country. There's just no backup. Yes. A lot of people feel. And that's what I show in report that victims of freedom restricting harassment, whether it's the Batley teacher, whether it's academics or journalists or anybody else, they are simply not being even recognized as victims. Um, they're not even recognized as victims of crime necessarily. The victim's code is not necessarily applied to them, which is why I'm calling on the government to officially recognize this phenomenon of freedom restricting harassment to ensure that we recognize and support victims of freedom restricting harassment. Because if we don't do something about this growing phenomenon. And let me be very clear, from our polling, 60% of the public think this has got worse in the last five years. If we don't do something about this, I'm afraid we will see an erosion of these precious democratic rights and freedoms of our country. That is something that we cannot tolerate. This is what marks us out as different to authoritarian countries, for example, our plural democracy, the right to free speech, the right to exercise our democratic rights and freedoms as citizens. And it's the government's responsibility to ensure that those rights are protected, which is why I'm calling on them to officially recognise this form of harassment and also to do much more to tackle the many contemporary threats I've identified in my review. Because at the moment, Peter, there is no adequate infrastructure that deals with any of the threats that I've outlined. And that is simply not acceptable. You've given a lot of advice to government in terms of what they should do, Sarah, and I think it's very, very sensible. What would you say to the man and woman on the street, the people watching this interview, who are self-censoring, who are not saying what they really feel within the law? How should they express those opinions? What should they do? How should they change their behaviour, do you think, Sarah? So, this is a really important question. I mean, I suppose I take it from two aspects. I mean, I, as an individual, I have experienced freedom restricting harassment, so I know what it feels like and and, and everybody is different and I, I can't tell people how they should behave because everyone has different levels of tolerance. I mean, I would always encourage people to go to the police, report the level of harassment that they're experiencing. Me, myself personally, I'm, I'm the type of person where if someone tells me not to do something, I'll very much do the opposite. If anyone tries to curtail my right to, to do what I want to do, whether it's a speech or anything else, well, that actually just winds me up even. But again, I, everyone's different and I don't expect everyone to behave in the same way as I do. What I would also say is that 
you know, at the end of the day, there are unfortunately there will be people we know who engage in this behavior, friends, colleagues, family. And it's important on all of us that we have to respect other people's rights and freedoms. If we want our rights and freedoms to be respected, we have to recognize others. If we dislike somebody's political opinion or whatever opinion they may hold, let's have that passionate debate as we do in this country. Let's have a good dialogue and even an angry debate. But surely we have to accept as a nation that when we start issuing death threats, when we start issuing yeah. rape threats, yeah. when we start doxing people's private information into, into, the, into the public domain, that are the red lines that we have to accept is just unacceptable. And I think those, those kinds of issues are something we as a, as a society society must have a debate about. Thank you so much, Dame Sarah Khan. You're doing important work. Really appreciate you coming on the programme. Candace, uh, Sarah makes some really, really good points there, doesn't she? And it is essentially about what I try to do on my programme, which is to be to, to disagree without being disagreeable. That's what we have to learn to do as a society. It feels like we do need to start cultivating those values again. We've sort of lost them a little bit. But it's like she said, you have to have a certain sort of personality yeah. in the current environment to yeah. be able to do that in these very febrile times. And I'm sure it's been like that throughout history. Well, there's know. so much fear, isn't yes. there? There's so much fear that you'll be cancelled, that someone won't like you or will, will say, not just I disagree with your opinion, but that you're a bad person That's for it. believing what you believe. I was talking to someone a couple of days ago who happens to work for the Conservative Party. She was on a date. She mentioned her job. The guy got up and walked out. I know. This is such a problem. We're siloing and we're falling into echo chambers. And that's why I say I think it really needs to start in schools. We need to start teaching children to self-express. And not only that their opinion is important, mm -hmm. but other people's opinions yes. is important as well. And actually, you can learn from other people. You don't know everything. Mm -hmm. Actually, other opinions and, can and, help and, you understand the world better. And have your opinion better. challenged, because if you have your opinion challenged, you'll know why you believe it. And well, nobody exactly. should be afraid to have their yes. opinions. Well, thank you very, very much indeed, I can We'll come back to you throughout the programme. And today we are asking about that new report, which says there is now a dangerous climate of harassment and censorship with 76% of people not expressing their opinion out of fear. Are you one of them? You can give us a call on 0344 499 1000. You can text me on 87222 with the word talk in your, in your text or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Noah's done that. He says, I have no shame saying exactly what I think. Good for you, Noah. Ma uh, Maureen says it's actually worse than that. People are afraid to say what they see. And Brian says, I'm fearful, but I'm compelled to be honest and speak up. I need to maintain integrity for me, not them. Well, some of you have been getting in touch on the phones as well. Keep those calls coming. Heather is in Scotland. Uh, Heather, you're very welcome to the programme this morning. What would you like to say? Do you know what you on campus speak right now? I agree with both of you there because my, I was brought up to speak your mind and to be truthful and honest with, with integrity. And I agree with you, with Peter, about disagreement. You have a right to disagree with your opinions. And, and we need to not fear that, Heather. We need to not fear disagreeing with one another. It, yeah, it, because it, everybody's have a right to express their, their own opinions and thoughts. But one key element is respect. Yeah. That is the fundamental problem of society, of this world. There's a lack of respect of how people talk, how people express their own opinions and use their own words. And no one can't put words in your own mind, yeah. in your own mouth. You are entitled to speak your own mind because that is what freedom of speech is all about, is use your own passion and be more thoughtful and creative with your mind without making threats or yeah. making intimidation on people because that is wrong. Do you, do you, do you fear, Heather, do you, do, you, do you worry about being uh, saying something that people will counsel you for or, or is an opinion that's unacceptable to other people or do you just get out there and, and express your opinion? I don't like people being shut down whatsoever. I, I, I believe in that fundamental clause of People have, should have the right to express their own opinions, whether you agree or disagree. Yep, absolutely. And Heather... what Candace is, is saying, and I want to say to Candace, uh, if I'm there, because I believe what Candace is saying, because she is right on every single key element of that. There we go. You too. 
Are what, you what, on talk TV? Everybody on talk TV uh, expressed your own opinion. We, we certainly do, Heather, and thank you for doing so yourself as well, and thanks for those kind words, Heather. And yes, we do. We are the home of free speech. We want to hear your opinions, controversial or not. Anything within the law, we will broadcast it on this station. And coming up after the break, more Tory turmoil, as one poll has Reform UK ahead of the Conservatives among male voters. I'm Peter Cardwell. You're with Talk TV. Stay with us. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for yeah. minute, for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Peter Cardwell. You're with Talk TV. Well, a new poll has again highlighted the growing unpopularity of the Tories amongst voters, with the latest figures uh, suggesting that Reform UK is ahead of the Conservatives among male voters, not least in red wall seats. Well, joining me now is the deputy leader of that party, Reform UK, Ben Habib. Thanks for uh, being in the studio, as is the pollster and co-founder of Delta Pool, Joe Twyman. Candace Holdsworth is with us as well. Let me ask Candace first, actually, before I chat to uh, the others. I mean, this is clearly very, very worrying for the Conservative Party. They are into the teens in these figures. I find it so interesting. I mean, I've sort of been very circumspect about the whole thing because I remember with UKIP years ago, you know, when you had all these Conservative MPs defecting to them and everyone was like, oh, the Conservatives are over. And then it kind of fizzled out. But maybe what we're seeing now is if you're seeing a collapse, an actual collapse in the Conservative vote in certain constituencies, then maybe that could mean that reform could actually do something in our first-past-the-post system. Well, let's very ask difficult. Them. Let's ask them. Ben, uh, Reform UK has... Uh, you have one MP, of course, Lee Anderson, but you've always, uh, in the last few years that you've been in existence, struggled in some, uh, in some elections anyway to get 
uh, success in that first-past-the-post system. But you must be delighted with these figures. I am utterly delighted. And they're right. The figures are right. And the people are beginning to see the Conservative Party for what it is, which is not Conservative. And Candice makes an interesting point. You know, in 2015, when um, uh, UKIP got 4 million votes across the country but didn't get a single seat, it looked like first-past-the-post was going to be a problem for an insurgent party. But I think uh, two or three things have changed since then. The first is that people have recognised that the Conservative Party actually isn't small c Conservative. Big tick in the box there. Second thing is the economy and the way people feel about themselves, the state of the country, the public services, our cultural setup, and everything else is all in the spotlight at the moment. After 14 years of Conservative government, people know that the country is broken. Um Whereas in 2015, the Conservatives were relatively popular. And so the 4 million votes UKIP got was in spite of the Although fact that... Although if you actually look at yeah. some of the statistics in this, Ben, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I take nothing away from the fact that reform is doing well. That is a fact. But at the same time, if you look at, at the relative stages within the electoral cycle, we'll go into this with Joe Twyman in a second. In 2014, UKIP, a uh, predecessor to your party, although UKIP still exists, uh, won the European election with 26.6% vote share. In 2019, uh, the Brexit party, um, of which Reform UK emerged, uh, came with 30.5%. So perhaps being on 16 17% actually isn't where you want to be at this stage in the electoral cycle. Well, I, I, well... Obviously, just, you wanted to be higher anyway, yeah, but what I'm higher. saying is, shouldn't it be higher? Well, in October... But let's just go back. You know, we're three years old, the party. We were polling at 1% three years ago. In October 2023, we were polling at 5%. Earlier this year, we were polling at 10% when I got my 13% vote count in the Wellingborough by-election. We're now polling at 15%. The Tories are down to 18 or 19. We're, in a we're within a smidgen of overtaking the Conservative Party. This is a very febrile political environment, completely different to any environment I've known in my life. I take the point you make about the European elections in 2014 and 2019, but people didn't take the European elections as seriously as they take the general election mm. or, or, or any any by but in the last in vote for a parliamentary seat, Rochdale, I mean, you did really badly there. Yeah, Rochdale was a really weird by-election. You know, you didn't have a Labour candidate because he was cancelled at the beginning. The whole Gaza-Israeli thing seemed to loom bigger than any domestic issues. And um, there was a lot of hate and vitriol and... Uh, it was, it was know, definitely a, a very strange set of circumstances. Strange, yeah. Joe Twyman from Delta Pool, uh, tell us what you think of these statistics. How widespread is this and how many MPs on this do you think that Reform UK could actually have after the next election or is it none? Uh, well, uh, there's no doubt that Reform UK have been a success story in the polls over the, uh, over the last few, uh, few months, certainly since October. That's uh, definitely true. They've improved their position. And it won't help come the general election because I don't think you'll win any seats. And... That is not to do with, uh, with the performance compared to the Conservatives. That's to do with the performance compared to Labour. Because you talk about uh, performance in the red wall seats doing better in the, uh, uh, among some constituencies uh, against the Conservatives. And that, that may indeed be true at this stage in the cycle. But you have to contend with the fact that, firstly, we would expect some Reform UK voters, probably around about a third, to go back to the Conservatives come the election. But more pressing is the fact that Labour in the Red Wall are considerably ahead. Of well, the only, the only counter I'd make to that is these polls don't measure those people who declare themselves not to be voting at the moment. And I think as people recognise who reform are, what we stand for, the fact we really do uh, believe in small-c conservatism, low-tax uh, deregulation, smaller government, Proud of the United Kingdom, strong borders, but strong defence. Does that happen that undecided voters go along those lines? I, I no. think no, no, they're, they're, they're not just... coming out for the Tories. Yes, let me tell you that. No, and that is, I would agree that yeah. that may be true. But the idea that they're going to switch to reform is simply not backed up by the data at the moment, or indeed by historical precedent. And I think particularly the difficult the difficulty that reform will have come an election is that you have to find six hundred, perhaps six hundred and thirty candidates. And a depth, a, a squad depth, to use the uh, to use the football metaphor, uh, is extremely difficult to establish in such a yeah. short period. Of I time. think, if you don't mind me saying so, you're hijacked by your view of precedence. Because what I'm saying 
is that the political environment now is more febrile than I've ever known it in my lifetime. More, more febrile than during the, uh, during the referendum for Brexit? Well, that was a referendum. It wasn't a general election. No, no, but you, but you, said, the poli you said the political situation. Yeah. And I'm saying it was as and febrile we then. And we voted for Brexit. Against all the precedents, against all the establishment nonsense, rhetoric and everything else, all the scare stories, the people came out and they said they wanted Brexit. And we are back in a position where the people want the United Kingdom to be put first and foremost, and they recognise the only party that will do it is Reform UK. Labour hasn't got a policy. All that Labour says is they won't do anything particularly nasty, otherwise they'll stick with the Tory agenda. And the Tories are completely out of ideas and they're imploding. Okay. We haven't seen this before in the UK. Tell us how significant it is that men are backing reform. Certainly, we see that 19%, especially in some red wall seats, uh, according to this polling. Uh, do those demographic groups really matter, Joe, or not really? Because, of course, everybody's vote is worth as much as yeah, anybody's, I mean, no matter what their sex. They, they definitely matter. And it's no surprise, really, based on the kind of historical situation that we've seen, whether it's support for UKIP, whether it's support for the Brexit Party, or whether it's support for reform. It tends to be higher among men. Men are more likely to support such groups. Uh, working class men are more likely to support such groups. People in some red wall constituencies are more likely to support such groups. And indeed, people who voted, uh, people who voted leave are more likely to support such groups. But that doesn't mean that there are enough of those people in such areas to bring about the kind of numbers that would be needed to overtake Labour. We will which see. Is what you, well, <laughs> yes, of course we will. And we have seen in the past. You're hijacked by precedent. Well, uh, Don't let history always be the judge of the future. We have to adjust is it the way we think. Is it possible that you're presenting a positive view from a strategic no, perspective? No, not at all. Look at where we were in the polls in October 2023, 5%. We're now at 15 We've trebled our position in six months. Well, so, and in the no, so, in another are, six, so in another six months, you'll treble it again? I, I, well, I'm not saying we're going to treble it again, but we are on the march. The political wind is in our sails and the Tory ship is floundering. It's hit the rocks. It's sinking. We haven't had but this situation But it's not the before. Tories you need to beat in the red wall. We need it's to get... Labour no. you need to beat. What we need to do is get the small C Conservative vote out. I want to That's talk about. We need. I want to talk about hijacking because we yeah. heard another story today, of course, that, that China has been hijacking our electoral data. We know that forty million people's information has been uh, has been uh, accessed by China. We were not given the full story. Now we have the full story. There's uh, going to be a statement by the deputy prime minister later today. How worried are you by the threat from China, Ben Habib? Well, I uh, the whole global position is extremely difficult at the moment. You know, we have um, a resurgent Russia in Ukraine. We had Russia pinned down, or Ukraine had Russia pinned down in the southeastern region. They were going to break through and repel Russia. That didn't happen. Russia is now spending eight times as much on military hardware than it did three years ago. The West seems to be half asleep at the wheel. NATO isn't spending, the NATO members aren't spending anywhere near as much as they should, with the exception of the US, on armaments. China is naturally being pushed into a corner with Russia. That's the alliance that's forming, China, Russia, and India to a greater or lesser extent. And then we've obviously got all the proxy wars that are taking place in the Middle East, you know, which is Saudi versus, in my view, the whole Gaza-Israel thing is really a, a Saudi versus Iranian um, geopolitical battle. And um, so we've got instability everywhere. And one of the things, without wishing to go back to party politics, that reform is very strong on is defence spending. And we've been a complete... But part of that as well is not just about hardware, military hardware, it's about misinformation, disinformation, and so on. And we've seen some of that apparently coming from China and Russia, or even over the weekend on uh, the Princess of Wales, uh, Joe Twyman. And I wonder, in terms of disinformation and misinformation, is there polling to show how much that influences people in their, in their voting and so on? I mean, uh, do we know how influential these foreign actors can be? Well, it's the kind of thing that's extraordinarily difficult to, uh, difficult to of test course, in, a yeah. in a survey instrument. Uh, well, that's kind of the point, isn't it? Yeah, uh, uh, and there is an important distinction between disinformation, which is deliberately incorrect information that is put out, and misinformation, which is information that is wrong, but people believe to be true that is, uh, that is circulated. So they're sort of doing it in good faith, essentially. Exactly. And, and one, indeed, 
an action by one actor in disinformation can lead to misinformation yes. from others. So, so it's a very complicated, uh, complicated picture. But I'm sure that in the UK general election, whenever it may be this year, but also crucially in the US election mm. in November this year, we will see an enormous amount of uh, attempted activity by, uh, by those both within the country and outside the country. Uh, the question is how much impact any of it will make, and we just don't know at the moment. Candice, what do you want to hear from Oliver Dowden later today? I think we're really going to have to start thinking about this now. I think the warfare of the future is going to look very much like active disinformation, then downstream from have that been misinformation. Ignoring it, do you think? Have, have, the, have the attempts to deal with this just not been strong enough? Well, I think yes. I mean, I think the social media companies, in particular Facebook, really struggled to get to grips with it at first. And it's something that, you know, very liberal, libertarian minded people do struggle with, you know, bad actors. And then, you know, we started seeing in, in 2016, we started seeing the influence of bad actors in, the ele in, in our elections. So I think it is something we do have to take very, very seriously. And going forward, we're going to have to really think about how we deal with attacks on our digital in infrastructure, deception, fakery. Um, are individuals, individual people, going to have to start becoming a lot more literate? And we're only just waking. Events. We're only just waking up to these risks. You remember, three years ago, Boris Johnson wanted to put Huawei through our 5G network. You know, the UK, as ever, has been incredibly slow to wake up to these risks. Donald Trump was calling out China years before anyone else was, and you know the the sort of established liberal intellectual elite all roll their eyes at Trump, thinking he was just a warmonger. But he was absolutely right about China. And we should have been taking preventative steps years ago, as we should have done with Russia and our dependence on, its, on, you, on Russian fuel. Do you worry just briefly, Ben, about the proximity of the American election to ours? There's been thoughts from Five Eyes, the security alliance around this, that we should actually split them apart because of misinformation and disinformation in two of the leading Western nations, G7 countries. Yeah, I mean, they will interfere. But I think Joe makes a very good point. Whatever these people do, I, actually, they can't go into the, into the ballot boxes and place votes. Mm. And uh, I, I don't feel that, no, notwithstanding their interference in the past, that actually they've had any material impact one way or the other. Well, we'll, voting intention. We'll, we'll continue to debate that. Thank you very much indeed to Ben Habib of Reform UK, Joe Twyman of Delta Pool, and Candice, of course, is staying with us. And today we're asking you about a new report which says there is now a dangerous climate of harassment and censorship. 76% of people, the report has found, have uh, not expressed their opinion out of fear. Are you one of them? Give us a call on 0344 499 1000. Text me at 7222 with the word talk in your text or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Barry's been in touch. He says, tell it as it is. If people don't like the truth, tough. Adam says, I will express my opinion with my vote. And Carol says, I don't care how people feel about what I say. I will always speak my mind. Well, someone who's about to speak their mind is someone who's been getting in touch on the phones. Keep those calls coming. Dave is in London. Thanks for picking up the phone. Dave, 0344-499-1000 is the number you've called. What would you like to say on this issue, Dave? Well, I've heard it. Can you hear me? Okay. Dave, have you got me? Yeah, can you hear me, mate? Yes, I can. You might need to switch off your telly or radio because yeah, there's a slight, I'll, I'll slight delay there. there. Yeah. I'll just stop me. I'll let me get me thing here. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to say, which um, they've brought up. Um, number one is um, the, the, the first question was um, about the uh, every two weeks these uh, people, the Palestinian or Hamas supporters, are basically stopping London. If that was to be the far right, they will be more. That would actually be bad. There's, there's definitely a lack of policing in terms of people supporting, uh, uh, holding up anti-Semitic, uh, yeah. chanting anti-Semitic things, holding up anti-Semitic posters, and so on. You, you feel there's two-tier policing, do you? Without, sh without a shadow of a doubt, um, there is two-tier police. You had that one guy a couple of weeks ago held up the the banner Hamas are terrorists. He gets nicked, but then he's obviously. Uh, he arrested and blah blah blah. Yeah, they arrested well, him. They said they said though that that was because they thought he'd taken part in an assault and it wasn't particularly to do with the banner. That's what the Metropolitan Police said anyway. No, if you saw it and you did obviously see the video, he was actually assaulted himself. Yeah, yeah. He so, was assaulted. So, they, so, they actually so, assaulted him. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I, I think there's no doubt he was a victim of assault. What do you? What would you like to say to the police in terms of this two-tier policing? What would you like them to do well, say, properly? Look, move it to someone like Hyde, Hyde Park. My daughter, she she works has to work weekends. She has to come in from Kent, so she she works in the Home Office. 
So she has to go through this way, that way, this route, that route, and it makes a, like, a couple of hours later to get to work. Just what about, what about the freedom to protest, Dave? Some people might say that's a fundamental not, part of our freedom and actually something that Hamas right, terrorists yeah. and, and other restrictive states wouldn't there want people no, to have. There is no freedom of speech in this country anymore. It is getting more and more against our freedom of speech. If you want, if I if I walked up the road with a banner, uh, uh, let's say a massive terrorist, which that guy did, then they would say to me, "Right, you're nicked because you're causing this." They yeah, they can put what they like. They can put the Israeli thing and say um, to the river, to the sea, and all this going, and they get away with it. So there is two two safe policing. Okay. Dave, thanks for your thoughts. Really appreciate them. And uh, yeah, uh, on this station, we are the uh, home of free speech. So people like Dave can say what they like within the law, as he just has. So thank you very much indeed to Dave. And coming up, uh, Kensington Palace has released a statement thanking well-wishers, but asking the public to give the Princess of Wales a bit of space. I'm Peter Cardwell. You're with Talk TV. Stay with us. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Peter Cardwell. You're with Talk TV. Kensington Palace has released a statement thanking well-wishers, but asking the public to give the Princess of Wales a bit of space. Well, joining me now is the former royal editor of the Sun, Charlie Ray. Uh, Charlie, the royal family has asked for privacy. Yeah, we're we're still talking about it. Are, are you and I part of the problem, or are we just covering a news story? I don't think we are. I think we're covering a news story. I think what they're talking about in the main is the fact that we still have on social media, uh, X in particular, the, um, the, 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 the critics who keep on saying things like even the video that she, she, she shot where she announced her cancer, 
was a fake video. Oh, well, it wasn't people, her. people saying where the wedding ring disappeared halfway through. Yeah, Look, it is a yeah. real video. Oh. It is, it is, it is correct. It is. Oh, I know it's really I know straightforward. It's a video, right? I know you're saying that, Charlie. But to any of the doubters out there, we both know that this is. I mean, that this was this, this was put out because of all the misinformation, disinformation. I wonder if you feel she was, was. Forced, actually forced into doing that video. I don't think she was forced. To, from what I've been told this morning, that uh, they had she and William had decided at least two weeks ago that they would be putting this video out. And the, the best time to put it out was uh, on the night that they did it because that's when the kids broke up for Easter. And they're now, I think they're now in Norfolk where they're going to have complete private time. They're not going to attend the Easter service uh, next Sunday, uh, you know, to allow her to recover. Um, and, I, and I think it's right that the, the palace keep saying, look, just leave it alone and, and let her get on with her life. She's got all these sort of things that she's got to sort out with the cancer, with the children and everything else. And I think it's right that she is left alone. I mean, I don't think... I mean, it's hard to sort of say that newspapers are at fault here. Although there are people I've been reading about, people sort of fed up hearing about royal stories and everything else. Well, that's just tough. Um, but I don't think it's newspapers as such, because we are reporting what is going on. That is their function in life. That's it's interesting, though, have Charlie, we, we have seen some uh, big figures in the media. We, we've seen Sarah Vine, for example, of the Daily Mail, saying that she had apologised yeah. because she was actually being critical of the royal family. But that, that to me, isn't the big... I mean, good for her for doing so and putting her hands up. That, to me, is not the big the big issue. I mean, China and Russia are uh, spreading yeah. slurs against the Princess of Wales. They're seeing this. They're spreading disinformation. And a government source has told the Telegraph newspaper, part of the modus operandi of hostile states is to destabilise things, whether it's undermining the legitimacy of our election or other institutions. And that is a big problem with the monarchy. It is a big problem. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, and, and I'm, I'm still suspicious of all the... The, the effects over the last uh, week or so of various stores who had their tills, you know, stopped, whether that was something to do with China or whether it was uh, just a, a, an internet glitch. Uh, yeah, there, it, there's some you know, stores, is, of, uh, Sainsbury's, for example, denied that, uh, Charlie, but certainly I, I think you're, you're right yeah. to be suspicious. I mean, we had Greg's, McDonald's and Sainsbury's and Tesco, actually, all had problems within the same few and, days. It does seem a remarkable coincidence. And Greg's. Don't forget Greg. Well, that's the well. most important bit. Can you get your sausage rolls, Charlie? <laughs> yeah, you can't, can't get a sausage. You couldn't get a sausage roll that day. Um, I mean, it's all right them saying no, it wasn't. It wasn't China. I mean, I don't know if it was China or not. It's just Max has been a bit suspicious that there's so many of those companies where. Uh, you know, affected in that way. And I'm not so sure what they're trying to do, the, the, the destabilisation of Britain. Well, I don't think Britain will be destabilised. I don't think you can destabilise Britain. We, we've got these glitches that, that happen. And part of the problem is, with our government, is that we are allowing China or Chinese companies to come into this country and do all sorts of things. That's you know, not you, helping the matter. Do you know the royals, Charlie? I mean, someone like... Uh, Princess Catherine, Kate Middleton, whatever you want to call her, all of this fury is bound to have a horrendous effect on her to say nothing of the treatment for suspected cancer that she's going through at the moment. But she does seem to be a very, very resilient person. Yes, yeah, she, she does seem to be a resilient person. But And, of course, um, you know, they have been stung by the criticism. Both she and William have been stung by the criticism and the accusations, quite a lot of it, which comes from America. You know, they started off this where is Kate scenario um, and everything else. You know, right at the start, we were told that she had, a, you know, this abdominal surgery and was going to be off, you know, work up until Easter. Well, since then, things, you know, the goalposts have moved a little bit. It's a little bit more serious than that surgery. And, you know, she's, she's got to take time to process, you know, as anybody has got to take time to process the fact that they're being told that they've got cancer. Um, and then she's got to, you know, she's a young mum, and she's got to tell her children, who are 10, 8 and 5 as well. And how These do you even explain to a 5-year-old that, 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 uh, that story that, you know, mummy's going through some serious uh, health issues? And, I mean, it's just, it, it's a very, very difficult thing for anyone, let alone someone who is so, is. so prominent in our society. 
It is, but I think Catherine has been doing it right. She has told the children, you know, mummy is going through some, you know, is, is not very well, but is feeling fine now and will get better. She's got a very positive attitude, uh, you know, towards her, uh, you know, her, her cancer. And, uh, you know, God bless her for it, you know, and best of luck to it. I mean, I don't know how you're going to stop all these idiots on, on X. I mean, it's just the Wild West. I mean, many people say that, but it's, it is just yeah. appalling stuff that's on there. Yeah, well, Charlie, thank you very, very much indeed. That's Charlie Ray there, former royal editor of The Sun. Candace Holdsworth is still with me. Um, Candace, it's so difficult to deal with cancer, as so many people do anyway, but in that prominent position with e even the... I had a, uh, an interview with someone over the weekend about this whose, whose husband um, uh, had cancer, who's an MP, and what's interesting is that she said, it's wonderful when all the well-wishers send cards and flowers and, and messages and people stop you in the street and so on, but it's also a bit overwhelming by itself. Of course it is. I mean, you are dealing with such a complex set of emotions when you get a diagnosis like that, not least of which because she has small children. So she can't just think about herself, she has to manage their feelings as well. If you well. don't mind me asking, how old are your kids? My kids are five and two and a half. So have you ever had, let's, let's not talk perhaps about the two and a half year old, but to a five year old, have you had to, to explain complex things? I mean, how have you kind of as a mother sort of dealt with that? Yes, exactly. Well, I mean, I not, it's not necessarily myself that's had to deal with something this tough. I mean, I had a childhood friend who was diagnosed with a very serious form of cancer and he had a small child and it was incredibly hard to deal with and you know it's not something that the children can ever really fully understand they just sort of become consumed by fear which is why she said in her her address we needed to explain it to them in a way that they could understand yes of course yeah um, and it's different with adult children you know adult children can rationalize things they can provide you with more emotional support mm -hmm. but very very young children they can't do that at all they're just going to be really scared of course of course um, do you think that we have caught a grip of ourselves over the weekend as a society that we've actually said, hold on a second, I'm going to not actually look on Twitter and like that and, and click that video about the Brazilian bum lift. I'm actually going to say, here are the facts. Yes. You know, the Princess of Wales is having treatment for suspected cancer. We're going to be really clear in terms of what the facts are and we're going to move on with our lives rather than indulging in this ridiculous speculation. Yes, I totally agree with you. I feel like it was a sobering moment. I mean, there were obviously those of us who from the beginning just thought, she's ill. You know, when someone's ill, they often retreat. There's no story here. But it built up so much momentum. And it is true that it's, you know, just trolls on social media. But the worst thing was it fed into the mainstream. And you had mainstream journalists and people on certain talk shows amplifying it, giving it credibility that it just did not deserve. And I hope now that people look at this. But then again, having said that, when people have invested so much in such a crazy wild theory and they're worried about reputational damage, maybe they'll just double down well, and of, find some, a way to pivot and, and justify and, and some it. some of them have online by even questioning the video, which was about the most straightforward thing yes. in the community. One shot and this was, you know, just her talking. I mean, how simple a video could you get? Candace, thanks very much. We'll continue to uh, talk to you throughout the programme. And coming up in the next hour, the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, is warning that we should be concerned about an Islamic State attack in the UK and a new report exposing the eye-watering costs of Labour's net zero plans. I'm Peter Cardwell. You're with Talk TV, stay with me between now and one. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! <laughs> it's carry on. What just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning, I'm Peter Cardwell. You're watching and listening to Talk TV. Coming up, China is accused of a malign attack on Britain's democratic institutions with fears that hack the details of 40 million voters. The UK should be concerned about the possibility of Islamic State terrorist attacks, according to the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, following the group's attack in Moscow, which has killed at least 133 people. And a new report claims Labour's net zero plans could cost the taxpayer a whopping £116 billion. Pounds. Well, what do you think of all this? Give me a call, 0344 499 1000. You can text me on 87222 or you can tweet me at Talk TV on Twitter or you can follow me at Peter Cardwell. But first, let's get the news headlines now with Divya Cooley. Good morning. MPs are set to be briefed about the cyber threat posed by China, while some individuals will be told about direct threats against them. Sources close to the matter have said the Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden is expected to make a statement to Parliament later, in which he will also outline the personal data of more than 40 million voters was accessed last year. Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, former United States Army Commanding General, told Talk TV it's too late to reverse what's happening worldwide. Our government, our elected officials have got to speak to all of us as if we're adults and be very clear that there is a threat. There should be no debate that this is a threat from China because of their access that we have turned over, maybe without realizing it fully, uh, we have turned over access. I mean, whether you have uh, different devices in your home, uh, not just phone calls being intercepted, but much more sophisticated things, of course, it's it's out there. And, Meanwhile, the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has said his party is committed to keeping the triple lock system on state pensions if the Conservatives win the election. The pledge means the increase is the highest of average earnings growth, inflation or 2.5 per cent. Labour is yet to reveal if the triple lock will feature in its manifesto. Four men have been charged with terrorism in Russia following a concert hall attack that killed 137 people. Three of the men were marched into a court in Moscow, while a fourth was pushed in a wheelchair. Russia claimed Ukrainian involvement. However, Kyiv says those allegations are absurd. Islamic State has since said it was behind the attack. US Vice President Kamala Harris says there's no evidence to back Moscow's claims. Let me start by saying what has happened in an act of terrorism and the number of people who've been killed is obviously a tragedy and we should all um, send our condolences to those families. Um, no, there is no whatsoever any evidence and in fact what we know to be the case is that ISIS-K is actually um, by all accounts responsible for what happened. 
A man's been arrested on suspicion of murder at Heathrow Airport just hours after a man was hit by a car and killed in East London. The Metropolitan Police say officers were called to reports of a crash in Newham yesterday where a 35-year-old was found injured at the scene. The Home Office has launched a social media campaign in Vietnam to deter migrants from coming to the UK illegally. The campaign will use adverts on Facebook and YouTube to target people in the Southeast Asian country who may be considering making illegal journeys to the UK. An increasing proportion of small boat migrants are Vietnamese. And drivers are being warned over long delays this week as more than 14 million Easter getaway trips are expected to take place. The RAC says journeys on some popular routes could take twice as long as the bank holiday weekend coincides with the start of a two-week holiday for many schools. Rail travel will also be disrupted as Network Rail carries out engineering works. That's the latest weather time now with Nazlin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's a wet start to the week. We're going to be seeing rain pretty much everywhere spreading northwards across the UK, although parts of East Anglia and the southeast just about staying dry with some brightness there later and feeling fairly mild with the southerly winds there. But everywhere else, it's going to feel cool under the cloud and the rain as it pushes up across parts of uh, the rest of England and Wales up into southern Scotland and Northern Ireland. Some wintry showers are likely across eastern parts of Scotland. And as we head into tonight and that wet weather continues its journey further northwards, hitting cold air, there will be significant snow likely for central and eastern parts of Scotland where the Met Office have a warning above 300 metres up to 20 centimetres likely and above 200 metres up to around 2 or 5 centimetres. So some disruption to travel likely by Tuesday morning. England and Wales though will be mostly dry except across the north and west where there will be spells of rain. Then through tomorrow we continue to see the rain and hill snow move and clear away from Scotland. It will come brighter there. Some rain edging up towards Northern Ireland and Wales, parts of the West Country We'll see rain at first heading towards areas of the Midlands and central southern England later in the day. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning, welcome back. I'm Peter Cardwell. You're with Talk TV. Today we're asking you about a new report which says there is now a dangerous climate of harassment and censorship with 76% of people not expressing their opinion out of fear. Are you one of them? Give me a call 0344 499 1000. Text me 87222 with the word talk in your text or tweet us on X at Talk TV. And uh, quite a few people have been doing that, including Angela, who says the newspapers are full of royal stuff. I think it's time they stopped on radio stations too. Uh, Man on the Moon says, Morning, Peter Cardwell. I would like to see Oliver Dowden, Deputy Prime Minister, uh, starting to fight Chinese cyber attacks instead of using resources on his own citizens. He disagreed with the whole COVID situation. I'm sure Julia Hartley Brewer would agree. Have a wonderful day. I should say Julia is uh, off for a few days. I'm filling in today, tomorrow and Wednesday. Um, another uh, Tweeter has said, Joe Twyman, who's the pollster who was on uh, about uh, 15 minutes ago, uh, Joe Twyman is absolutely right. I live in the Old Ridge Brown Hills constituency and would love to vote for Reform UK, but the Reform UK candidate here is someone that Ali doesn't feel is credible and not someone I could possibly vote for. The selection process is flawed, he says. Wendy J also says, the Tories are now full of fluffy liberal wets. They're a broad church without a religion and Reform UK gets her vote. Well, that's something certainly that the polls are showing that Reform UK are doing better and we spoke to to its deputy leader, uh, Ben Habib, just a minute ago. Well, joining me now to run through all the other top stories is writer and commentator Candace Holdsworth. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. Um, I mean, we'll talk about reform in a minute, but China being accused of its malign attack on Britain's democratic institutions, fears it hacked 40 million voters' details. We weren't given the full story about this. Now we have it. We're hearing from the deputy prime minister later today. But as we've seen over the weekend as well, even something as... Um, it's important, but of course not important to our democracy and the way people vote on the on the government of the day, is what uh, the Princess of Wales has been saying. And we've seen so much misinformation, disinformation, attacks by foreign actors like China, like Russia and others, North Korea as well. This is a huge problem, Candice. It is. It's, it's what, um, like I mentioned earlier when I was on the panel, 
that's what the digital warfare of the future is going to look like. And it's of the present as well. Yes, and we're going to have to start adjusting to that, especially as we start talking about increased defence spending. And you just wonder, where is that money best spent? And I mean, I think people sort of think very traditionally in terms of weaponry and um, uh, armaments, but I think it's also going to have to be invested in intelligence. I totally agree with you. And it's interesting because people say, when people think of conscription, which is a big argument as well, uh, personally, what any military people I speak to say they don't want people who are uh, who don't want to be in the military in the military you shouldn't force people mm -hmm. to do it but when they talk about conscription you often think of sort of 18 year olds running around fields and shouting at one another and uh, firing rifles and so on but actually I wonder if there are people in later on in life perhaps who are good at computers for yes. example who can deal with this who could set maybe even work from home I mean maybe you wouldn't want to do that from a security point of view but actually people who can contribute to the fight against China and Russia because so much of the war is now online it's not about necessarily about tanks and planes although that that's important as well. That's a very interesting point. Yes, it's going to require a whole new skill set. But I do think younger generations who've grown up online and are very literate about public discourse and the way it's conducted online could actually have a lot to offer. I mean, they are true, you know, that you always use the phrase, they are true digital natives. Yes. And they are, and they may be attracted to this. I mean, that's one way to um, um, sell it to young recruits. I mean, they obviously don't want to go and die in some field somewhere but if they can Although think, that's kind of part of it as well yes what many people have done and sacrificed their lives for our, for our society and of course that will continue but in a, in kind of in a different way yes well it is it's maybe a bit more problem solving it's mm. more cerebral and that might attract people um, and attract yeah. a new generation because that is one of the problems the army has said that they've had they've struggled with recruitment what sort of relationship do you think we should have with for example china what what i mean we want their investment we want their products although some people say we should manufacture far more in this country and i agree with them and actually even the um people from an environmental perspective say well we're importing so much and that yes. is carbon emissions and all the rest of it. so there are all sorts of arguments around this some of which i agree with some of which i don't but really, it, you cannot ignore China. You can't just say, right, we're going to be isolationists. We're going to completely ignore uh, one of our most important trading partners. But if they are spreading slurs against the Princess of Wales, if they're hijacking our voting uh, records and so on, how do, you, how do you square that circle? It's very difficult because we just don't have a straightforward relationship with them, like you say. We're so economically intertwined with them and so much manufacturing has gone to China over a number of years that it's actually very difficult for us to disentangle ourselves from them. But of course, you know, things are becoming a bit more adversarial with China. I think people thought that the more that we sort of cooperated economically, mm. the better relations would be, but that's well, not this, necessarily well, and, the case. And many politicians, including a certain prime minister called David Cameron, thought that would be the case. Another prime minister who changed her views dramatically on this was Liz Truss. Yes. There's a great book about this called Out of the Blue by James Heal, who sometimes contributes to this uh, station. And of course, um, Harry Cole, the political editor of The Sun, who's got a brand new show actually on this uh, station and on Line as well called Never Mind the Ballots, which is on Thursdays at 8 o'clock. They've written a great book about Liz Trust and they chart her views on China being mm. really, really pro-China at one yes. point, saying we've got to engage, we've got to get all their business, we've got to have all those economic relationships. And now where she, like other people, like Ian Duncan Smith, Tom Togenhat, for example, the security minister, who have been told they are not welcome in China. They've actually been banned from China. So there's a, a very yes. difficult tightrope for Rishi Sunak and others to walk, and Keir Starmer as well, when he almost certainly becomes prime minister. Yes, I mean, you've sort of seen a big rise in nationalist sentiment in China, which has, has changed the relationship compared to maybe 20, 30 years ago when they really did want to integrate into the global economy again. On the other side of it, do we need to be pragmatic? Is it better to keep China on side? Do we want to make an enemy out of China? No, thine enemy. Keep your enemies close. I know, because we're in a very unstable world and there's all kinds of shifting alliances and we're sort of wondering, you know, we have to figure out, you know, who we can treat as, as not necessarily friends, but people who are kind of useful. Yeah. To not be but in But also there's that moral with... outrage, of course, over their treatment of the Uyghur Muslims, for example, with that. Russia, of course, no. where we have this basically proxy war in Ukraine as well. It's a, it's, a, it's a massive, massive issue. Let's turn to domestic thoughts on this because um, Labour have been under a lot of criticism yeah. for many uh, years, really, and, and certainly a long time. And we're, there have been lots of people, including the Conservative Party, talking about a hole in their finances over their Green New Deal, over their thoughts yeah. on net zero, 28 billion pounds. But actually, we're going to talk to Ian Mansfield from Policy Exchange, a think tank in London, in a minute about how 
their plan to make the electricity grid carbon zero by 2030 could actually cost 116 billion pounds. That's money this country just doesn't have, Candace. I know, and this is what the IMF economist Olivier Blanchard was talking about a few years ago. He made a lot of, I mean, a few months ago, he made a lot of headlines about it. He was saying that if we're going to fund net zero, it's going to have to be through increased borrowing because that you just won't be able to justify the extra taxation because the costs are going to be huge. They're going to be enormous. Um, we have to be pragmatic about that and we have to think how we're going to justify that to, to voters. I mean, what you want to hope for is that you get such good technological Logical innovation that's adopted, widespread adoption, and it brings prices down. Yes. Um, but at the moment, we're not seeing that. Unless, of course, people are willing to be pragmatic and, you know, think of things like gas as a bridging fuel, a bridging fuel until we get to net zero, for, for example, and not just immediate decarbonisation. Mm, and that is, that is, I mean, there is this real leap towards that, isn't there? And this thought that fossil fuels, of which we're sitting on loads of them, actually should never be used in some people's opinion. But that's just not realistic, is it, Candace? I don't think so. And, you know, from what I know, the debates that went on amongst various people on all different sides of this debate, that was what people thought. They thought that gas being the cleanest of those is the fuel that we would use. But I think that there is a sort of extremist element that's just trying to sort of shut that down mm. and, and move immediately to, to renewables. But I don't think that that's achievable. I think that, you know, things like electric, electric cars, for instance, there was a lot of enthusiasm and it for them at the beginning and it was great and it seemed like this is the way forward but over time you've seen people have become a kind of a bit disillusioned with them mm -hmm. you know especially in the in the second hand market they're not selling well they don't yeah have I, a I didn't range. think about this over the weekend actually with someone who spent a lot of money on an electric porsche yes. and now it's worth about i think it's worth less than a quarter of I what know. it was previously there are all these problems about the the heaviness of yes. the uh, electric vehicles as well we have potholes as a massive problem as well i yes. mean there are just so many issues around that. Um, I know um, you will have been as upset as me, Candace, to see that uh, story that uh, Just Stop Oil was uh, infiltrated by a very enterprising Mail on Sunday reporter and someone from Just Stop Oil, these eco loons on the left, said that uh, they were too white and middle class. Who'd have thought <laughs> that uh, an organisation that puts up spokespeople called Indigo Rumbelow, yes. that is her real name, and Alex de Koenig, which means Alex the King, um, who was, or Alex of the King, I think, who uh, told my producer to go F himself oh, I remember at that. one point and then, in fairness, apologise, but I'll never interview him again, mm. um, would, would be, were, were too white and middle class and perhaps slightly detached, actually, from the real lives of people who chose not to actually go out and support their ludicrous vigilante protests. I think that's true, and I think that's why there's a sort of failure to understand why people don't want to adopt certain expensive technologies and also why people still are very reliant on their cars, they're still very reliant on fossil fuels because people have ordinary incomes and ordinary budgets and they have to put that first. I mean, I think, a, I think you know, for the most part, the consensus is people think this is something that we need to address. Well, people, people I, I think you're absolutely right, Candace. Like, people, I don't think anybody wants to uh, pollute the planet. No. I don't think there's anybody who says, I won't do my bit. I'll, yes, I'll recycle. Yes, I'll maybe fly a bit less, although some people are, are very much against that. But actually, maybe there's something we can do. But there is, there is, uh, uh, there are so few people who actually feel they personally can make a difference, or even we as a country can make a difference when our emissions are about 1%. Oh, that's huge as well. I mean, that's also a massive, massive thing. I mean, how much, you know, Britain has done very well in reducing its global carbon emission contribution, but the big polluters are elsewhere. Yeah. That doesn't mean we have to give you, up. You don't see a huge amount of thanks uh, and uh, sort of congratulation, essentially, from the Green Lobby saying just how much the UK has reduced no. its carbon emissions. It's always more and more and more, isn't it? Yes, yeah, they're fanatical. There's a fanatical element. I think this is the problem, and I think this is the problem that so many people have. You know, it's not that we disagree, that it's not that we, we don't think that climate change is happening or it's not happening. It's the solutions. That's what a lot of people have a problem with. The solutions that are proposed, they're just not practical, and in many ways will make people poorer and colder, and it will mean a huge drop in our living standards. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone's ever, I don't think ordinary people have ever had a say in that. Well, well, they haven't, although uh, I come back to the point that net zero, for example, as a policy was in all the major parties' manifestos in 2019, but of course the 2019 election wasn't about net zero, it was about Brexit. Yes. I want to ask you about another story, political story. This is about the Home Office launching Stop the Boats ad campaign mm -hmm. in Vietnam. Uh, very, very interesting, uh, deterring Vietnamese nationals, deterring them from illegally 
migrating to the UK. The government says the adverts will set out the risks of small boat crossings. An increasing proportion are made by Vietnamese migrants. Mm. This is not something we think about a lot because they get to France by other means, of yes. course, and then come across the channel. I know. Look, I think that possibly this is something that could be useful. I mean, the, the Daily Mail ran a story recently by an Iranian man who um, tried to claim asylum in the UK, and he got to France, I mean, after this incredible journey, um, and the traffickers tried to point him towards Britain because they said, you'll have a better chance there. Um, you'll have a better chance of, of getting asylum. And he said when he actually arrived in Britain, he became completely disillusioned. It was not what he thought mm. it would be. And I think that's what people need to do. This is what these, these campaigns need to do. They need to disabuse people of these very unrealistic expectations they have. I mean, he said when he was in the dinghy in the channel, he said it, it was sinking. You know, it was yes. very, very yeah. scary. Yeah. And he realized this is serious. And that's not something that he probably would have known about beforehand. Mm. People, you know, they're looking for better lives. I don't want to fault all of them. They're not all, you know, people just think it's all criminals trying to break into, into, but that, that, into I mean, that is an element of it. It I'm is an element of it. We've seen Albanian crime gangs, for example, although there has been a 90% reduction in arrivals from Albania after this ad campaign that the Home Office did in Albania. So there is evidence this works in some areas. Yes, I think so. It is. I mean, there is there is a huge amount of evidence it can work. Look, you can't just rely solely on social media campaigns, though. I mean, obviously, you have to look at legal deterrence yeah. um, and managing incentives and what incentivizes people to come over. You know, that's why so many people want to look at tightening up the asylum system so you, that it's not as easy to make claims. So people don't even pay the human traffickers because they know that the chance of getting of claiming asylum in the country is very, very, very low. Mm. Uh, we were talking about Reform UK earlier, and they are doing pretty well in the polls. Obviously, there are some uh, times we look at UKIP previously and the Brexit party in 2019 that did better, but there's no, there's no doubt about it. Reform UK are doing well in the polls. They've overtaken the Conservatives in some constituencies uh, with men, for example, as well. I mean, I did think a little bit about asking Ben Habib, the deputy leader, uh, you know, should I ask him actually direct questions? You know, how many seats are you going to win? Where are those seats going to be? What's your yeah. vote share going to be? But of course, he'll say, well, look, we're working towards this and, and all the rest. And Ben's very good and he asks, he answers the questions very directly and he's never shied away from anything. I've asked him, but really this is uh, very, very worrying for the Conservative Party and Labour presumably must be rubbing their hands with glee as well, Candace. Yeah, that's what's going on. I mean, you're seeing um, the Conservative vote being very heavily eaten into in certain constituencies. And it's if, if this pattern holds, if this trend holds, it's looking like a massive Labour victory yeah. at the moment. Um, I, you know, it's, it's it's an interesting thing, you know, dealing with electoral campaigns. You know, you've kind of got the hard mathematics of it, just the, the numbers, but then it's also about kind of judging the political mood. Yeah, and, and knowing, politics is such an emotional thing. Yes, how people engage with it or actually don't engage with it because yes. there's still a lot of undecided voters and unsurprisingly until you're actually asked. It was funny when I worked on election campaigns. I worked in two election campaigns for the Conservative Party. I'm not a member of the party anymore. But they were, uh, they were really interesting because you, you, you sort of slogged your guts out for about five weeks on these campaigns. And suddenly, about three or four days beforehand, people who aren't engaged with politics, which if you ever work in politics, you should always engage with as much as possible to keep your feet on the ground. Yes. About three or four days beforehand, I remember friends and family, especially in Northern Ireland, went, oh yeah, there's an election this week, isn't there? Oh yeah, I'm, oh, I must get my uh, voter ID and I must do this. And where's my polling station? And suddenly people start to engage with it in a way that they haven't previously. And I wonder with all those undecided voters, I mean, they're undecided, so where will they go? Ben Abib was sort of saying, oh, well, we think they'll go to reform. Mm -hmm. Joe Twyman, who's impartial, of course, and was talking about uh, the historical side of this, said, well, actually, some of them might go back to the Conservatives. See, we don't know. This election is going to yeah. reveal so much. Because I think that the coalition that sort of kept the red wall and the blue wall together for the Conservatives, that's that's broken up. Yeah, that's it was sort of a perfect storm of Brexit, of Boris Johnson. Yes. Of, I mean, 2019 was, a you know, Jeremy Corbyn being the leader of the Labour Party. 2019 was a, a fascinating time just for it, it sort of all came together did. for the Conservative Party in a way that it's all fallen apart for the Conservative Party in the last five years. And it was so shrewd of the Conservative Party at that time to capitalise on that, to be able to do that, to be able to figure out, like we were just saying, the numbers, but also the political mood. But this time, I'm wondering, my personal opinion is, you know, what is going to remain of the Conservative Party? You know, I mean, a lot of people have been projecting that a lot of the, the Liberal Tories will go more towards um, Labour. Mm. Labour will sort of mop up those votes and to some extent that the Liberal Democrats 
Democrats, and you'll sort of be left with a, a, a more right-wing faction of the Conservative Party. And that's also a sort of shift in the political but landscape. I think, I think there are big questions about whether Sheila Braverman retains her seat. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, even on the left of the Conservative Party, if such a thing exists, Penny Morden's only got a majority of 15,000. A lot of that was a, a Brexit vote as well. It's going to be an absolutely fascinating it will. few months, not just for the for the sort of cone-headed uh, yes. kind of people like us, but also for everybody else in the country. Yes. Candace, thank you very much indeed. Candace Oldsworth, uh, writer and commentator, staying with me throughout the programme. So thank you for that. And today we're asking you, not just about the issues I've been talking to Candace about, but also about a new report which says there is now a dangerous climate of harassment and censorship. 76% of people asked, three out of four, were, were said they did not express their opinion out of what? Out of fear. Are you one of them? Give me a call, 0344 499 1000. You can text me on 87222 with the word talk in your text. Or you can get in touch on x at talk TV. Brianna says, facts do not care about feelings. Alicia says, I'm scared to answer. Uh, perhaps you have your tongue in your cheek there, Alicia. And John says, I don't care what I say or who I offend. And uh, thanks for the calls as well, 0344 499 1000. Lisa in Nottingham has given me a call. She's done just that. Lisa, you're on the air. What would you like to say? What do you make of this? Good morning, Peter. Good morning. I don't think we're losing the freedom of speech. I think we've already lost it, and it's been lost for some time, not only when you verbally speak out, but also, you know, on social media, they've got the algorithms out there, and, um, you know, they'll just pick you up straight away. There's new laws coming in. Obviously, there's a new law coming in into Scotland shortly. In Scotland, yeah. We're, we're, we're going to talk about that over the next couple of days, actually, because that is a very worrying development. It's maybe a, a, actually a logical extension of what we're talking about today. What, what do you feel you can't say? What have you stopped yourself from actually saying in the workplace or to friends or whatever, Lisa? Well, I think most of the time you actually think in your head about what you're wanting to say and how that is going to be accepted. And, and I, I feel that the only way we've got, in, in quote brackets, freedom of speech is if you um, agree to all what's currently going on with all the different top, topics and so on and so forth. The but sort of liberal consensus, I, Lisa. Exactly. And if you have a different opinion to that... Um, you know, like, just for example, I don't think um, the LBGTQ um, should be using rainbows because I feel the rainbow symbol is to do with children and it's that childhood thing and it's been associated. I wish it would come up with something else. But as soon as you say anything like that, you know, you are such a, an awful person. And I'm like, no, I, I don't agree, disagree. If, if people love who they love, that that isn't my issue. You're, you're not you're not you, being you anti-gay. You're not being you're not being to, you're not being horrible to people who aren't straight. You're saying, why have you used this symbol? You're at, you're you're using your critical faculties there. Well, exactly. But when I uh, put something on my social media a long time ago. The, the stuff I got thrown at me and I even had um, the social media um, taking it down and giving me a warning. And I'm thinking, well, I'm not being anti-gay or anything. Like I said, love is love and I respect what everybody does. But, the, you know, and I'm just using this as one example. Yeah, just one example, yeah. And it's, and it's, a, it's actually a very harmless example. It's a really, you're not, you're not saying anything really out there. You're saying something really quite straightforward. Exactly. Well, that's the thing, and uh, but, but even something like that, and it's it's just everything now. You have to think about what you say because people will throw stuff at, at you. So and, you're you know, you're actually self-censoring, Lisa. You're someone who's saying, Do you know, what? I have all these thoughts, I have things I want to say. There are things that maybe 20 years ago I could have said, and there wouldn't be a big issue. But actually, now you're saying, I'm not going to put that on Twitter. I'm not going to say that in the workplace because I'll get all this vitriol. This is very true, and even jokes, you know. You know, you've got to think about the jokes that you're telling because, again, you know, people are going to come at you. And I'm just thinking many, many years ago, you know, for women's rights and all these different things over all this time we've fought for and, and progressed forward. And, that. and I think now we're doing a 180 degree turn and that's it. And it's not only about what you can say. I, I feel we're getting very tunneled in what we are allowed to do in society as well and you are like sheep having to go down for example unisex toilets that have come in you know you have to use unisex toilets or you're not using a toilet anymore so i just feel it you know it's like a spider's web isn't it, it and, and you look you look at you, you know i've i've been forced to use unisex toilets and you just got to look at the at people there of the opposite sex and you just think we're all we're all sort of slightly embarrassed to be here but we're all kind of 
not actually expressing our opinion on this, and maybe I've self-centered too. Lisa, really, really good points. Thank you very much indeed. Lisa in Nottingham there, thank you for her call, 0344-499-1000. Let us know what you think of what Lisa said and about this issue in general, and also uh, about what we're going to talk about next, which is a new report claiming that Labour's 2030 net zero plans could cost the taxpayer a whopping £116 billion. We're going to talk about that next. I'm Peter Cardwell. You're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position. But I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to <laughs> just yeah. for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Peter Cardwell. You're with Talk TV. Now, a new report by a think tank claims that Labour's 2030 net zero plans could cost the taxpayer a whopping £116 billion. Well, joining me now is Ian Mansfield. He's Director of Research at Policy Exchange. Ian, thank you for joining me on this. How have you come up with this figure? Because we've heard all sorts of figures about net zero plans. Certainly the £28 billion is one we're very familiar with in terms of Labour. But just tell us your calculations. What are, what's behind this huge figure to our public finances, which, of course, we just can't afford in the current cost mm. of living crisis? Absolutely, Peter. So essentially, we've done some, well, we've worked with um, Aurora um, Energy Services to do some very detailed economic modelling. It takes a real bottom-up approach, looking at all the different projects you'd need, how many wind farms, how many solar plants, all of the rest of it, and builds that into an overall figure up over the next, uh, next years. And the real thing about the 2030 plan is that an awful lot of this finance needs to be front loaded. So of that 116 billion, 93 billion of it, that's over 15 billion pounds a year, would need to be spent in the next six years between now and 2030. And that's a colossal amount. 
so a really that, close that's, one. Yeah. When you say front loaded, you mean at the start, the outlay essentially before you get any benefit, before this would go on and so on. Um, it's interesting as well that you find about the millions of tons of steel building pylons will also mm. be required. Carbon capture technologies actually unlikely to be ready. So even if the money is there, even if Chancellor Rachel Reeve say after the next election she becomes the first yep. female chancellor of this country, uh, says yeah. right, we're actually going to go for this. We're going to put this money in. It's going to cost a lot more than she thinks it's going to. And also, according to your report, and also a lot of the technology might not even be ready yet, Ian. Yeah, I mean, it's, you've hit on absolutely the core point of this, Peter, because if you look at, say, the 2035 target, that's still ambitious, but you could get there if you put the money behind it. In 2030, um, you, let's just take offshore wind, for example. So historically, we've been building about one gigawatt of offshore wind a year. In order to hit the 2030 target, we need to be building six gigawatts a year, that's six times as much over the next six years. And then, you know, even with the best will in the world, you can't go from one to six over the overnight. And it's similar figures if you look at solar, if you look at batteries. And just to give some indication of this, you know, a wind farm typically takes 11 or 12 years to build from first conception to actually generating power. How can you get those online in just before 2030? And of course, things like more nuclear are completely out. And that's actually a real danger. But if we tried to throw everything into going for 2030, we'd actually be ruling out some really important technologies, and nuclear is the big one here, but also some of um, the things around carbon capture and storage, which could actually get us to net zero on a more realistic time frame and in a more affordable way. Ian, let's talk a little bit about nuclear, because it's kind of the elephant in the room, and a lot of people don't want to say that nuclear is generally pretty clean, generally very reliable, and actually used by many other countries. Like France, for example, uses a lot mm. of nuclear power. But we've seen successive governments, uh, the Liberal Democrats were part of the coalition government when Nick Clegg didn't want to invest in nuclear, but we've also seen 14 years of the Conservatives in government not investing in nuclear. What, what, in terms of what Labour would want to do in nuclear, that's, I think, slightly unclear as well. But really, it makes perfect sense to invest in nuclear, doesn't it? Absolutely. So a key recommendation in our report that we should go ahead with both mainstream nuclear and also SMRs, the sort of small modular reactors. And actually, just again, this is about... small modular about... reactors are, Ian, because I think a lot of people just, yeah, just don't know. Yeah, they're basically know. like a sort of a miniature nuclear reactor that's a lot easier and quicker to build. I mean, it's not that easy. It's still a nuclear reactor than, you know, the massive size world power stations that you're used to and can be built and generated. It's similar to sort of a bigger version of the things that you get on nuclear submarines, for example. And actually, this is what we're saying. We should be focused on getting to net zero by 2050, the overall trajectory, and not rushing it for an unrealistic target in 2030. And um, the thing about nuclear and renewables is essentially they're two sides of the coin. So renewables, solar and wind, they're brilliant at giving you very cheap electricity. But obviously, we know the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. And so you've also got to have this base load. And that comes from nuclear. It can also come from residual gas. And actually, most models say you still always will need a tiny bit of gas in the system compensated for by carbon capture and storage, just if you know you get a one week period in winter where you get barely any wind. So you'll still need that there as a backup. And actually, we can do great stuff on decarbonizing the grid. And demand is going to rise as we all start buying electric cars and heat pumps and whatnot. But we can do great stuff on decarbonizing it if we do it sensibly. And part of what we're doing with this report is that politicians like to go on the air, they like to make announcements, they like to make these commitments. But as we go into an election year, we want to make sure that everyone has the best evidence available to them about what these commitments would actually cost and whether or not they are achievable. Talking about politicians, in uh, Keir Starmer is in North Wales today it's with the Welsh First Minister Von Gething. Um, he has, uh, Sir Keir is going to argue that Labour's plans for a publicly owned clean energy company will get Putin's boot off our throat amid the war with Ukraine. He's also going to say that a British owned power company will be a key pillar of a British uh, modern British economy. He's mentioned that a number of times previously, including in his uh, conference speech last year. He says that will offer secure, homegrown British energy. This is a basic duty of government, and it's fr frankly unpatriotic for the Tories to oppose it. What do you make of those comments? I would say that who owns the power company is a little bit of a distraction. I mean, as long as it's not Putin. I mean, you know, we can have it owned by the state or we can have it owned by a private company. What actually will make us energy sufficient? isn't whose name is on the top of the note paper. 
but it's how many wind farms do we have? How much battery storage do we have? Do we have nuclear plants up and generating? Do we have supplies of gas waiting there in winter so that we have those reserves that we can draw on? It's not about ownership, it's do we actually have the means of generation available? So I'm not necessarily who, against it. I just don't think it's the most important thing. There will be people who question, and I, I think I'm one of them actually, the wisdom of net zero actually as a policy in terms of the huge societal economic change that we need or would need to get to net zero when actually our emissions are about 1% of global emissions. You're talking about what can get us there, but will it actually be worth it even if it happens in uh, the way that, that, that you outline? Yeah, so I think it will be worth it as long as we do it in a sensible way. I mean, if you look at the cost curves on things like um, solar power, on wind, we can actually see, I mean, if you look at, at wind, 10 years ago, this was, you know, typically um, costing more than, you know, £100 per, you know, per unit generated. And that's come down by about half or a third. It's happening on solar as well. You just look at the lines, and they're, they're absolutely falling. And actually... The energy crisis that we saw two years ago shows us what happens if you are dependent on fossil fuels, which are being imported from pretty unstable reach, um, areas of the world. So in the long term, you know, this is the next industrial revolution. If we don't want to be left behind, we've got to get with the program. But we've got to make sure that we do it at a rate that A, can be afforded, B, that we can actually build and C, is sustainable. You know, it's, it needs to be a smooth and seamless transition. That's what the British public and the British consumers are going to want. Ian, you're one of my favourite wonks. Thank you very much indeed, Ian Mansfield, our Director of Research at Policy Exchange Think Tank. Well, still with me is the writer and commentator, Candace Holdsworth. What do you make of what Ian was saying there, really, that there's so much that can be done, but actually is it desirable to do it, and how much is it actually going to cost? I mean, I think this is the emerging debate now. It's the, the, the middle ground that's emerging from when we, you know, we sort of spoke about the moral imperative. That's pretty much what we spoke about, the moral imperative of getting to net zero, and they were kind of those who opposed it. Mm. But now people are actually starting to think about the practical implications yes. of it. And putting and it's just, right we question that. And we should. And, you know, I think it feeds into so much of what we've been talking about, about being able to freely express what is important to you. Yes, And yes. we need to be able to do that. And, and I have think, a debate. I mean, I hear people who say, the science is settled. This is a settled argument. I we can't know. have any further discussion about it. And actually, we want to have further discussion about this and everything else, especially as well as the new report we're talking about today that says there is now a dangerous climate of harassment and censorship. 76% of people not expressing their opinion out of fear. Let me tell you, Candace is not one of them. Uh, so let me know if you are, in fact, one of them. Have you self-censored? Have you not said things in your workplace or to your friends or on Twitter or whatever because you're worried about what people will think? 0344 499 1000. Text 8722 with the word talk in your text. We're going to touch on X at Talk TV. Richard says, no, I won't be silent. Stuart says, Humza Yusuf and his hate law in Scotland is the latest example of why ordinary people are frightened to open their mouths. Do you know what? We need to talk about that in this show. I think we'll do that tomorrow Wednesday. I'll talk to the top brass about it and see if we can do that. Maggie says, this is a dangerous climate that's being created by the media and our government who continuously look to avoid debate or accountability. Well, let me tell you, we're not part of that here at Talk TV. Uh, some of you are getting in touch on the phones as well. Let's keep those calls coming. 0344 499 1000. Chris is in Grimsby. Good morning, Chris. How are you doing? All right, Peter. How are you? Very well, thanks. What do you make of all this? Well, I'm 73 year old. I could remember when I was 14, 15 year old, you had free speech. And very rarely did anybody get into trouble for it. There was no, not a lot of fighting or any problems. Nowadays, you can't say anything. You've got to be guarded in everything you say. What do you feel you can't say, Chris? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a prime example of what, what I was going to put forward anyway. Yep. Now, if I disliked a black person not because they're black, not because of race or anything, but if I said I didn't like someone for whatever reason, their attitude, the policies, whatever, the black card would be played straight away that assume I'm against black Does that people. always happen, Chris, all the time, do you think? I, I, I think it does. I, I really think it does because 
I've seen lots of people on television being interviewed, programmes like your own. I, I think no, I, I, like... I, would, I agree with you it, it, that that is a thing that happens from time to time, but I just don't think it happens all the time, Chris. But certainly, I mean, yeah. it is something that you... you the, people definitely self-censor in that regard and other regards in regard to race. Yeah, that, yeah. But, but that is the problem. If you want to dislike somebody because of what they say or their policies, if they're black especially, you get hounded by a lot of people saying you're a racist. I, I think it's actually I, really... I, I, I actually... I, I think it's really patronising, actually, to a load of people who are of minority races as well to think that, you know, th that, that they were... Not patronising what you're saying, obviously, but this kind of assumption that actually, well, if you disagree with them, you're racist, you're sexist, you're uh, homophobic or whatever. I mean, people are people. Yeah, but that is what people are frightened of. If they, if they say this, that yeah. they may get, you know, branded a racist. It's like the, the, the gender thing. I am never, ever going to call a trans... Uh, you know, if it's trans from a man to a woman, that is a man. I, I am not going to be forced into saying it's a woman because it isn't. Nor, nor, nor should you be, Chris. Around. Nor should you be. Nor, nor, nor should you be forced to do that. I, I agree with you. Chris, thank you very much indeed. Chris is not a racist. Chris is not a transphobe. Chris is someone who is just expressing his opinion. And thank you to him for doing that on 0344 499 1000. And you can do that too. Well, coming up, China is accused of a malign attack on Britain's democratic institutions with fears it hacked the details of 40 million voters. I'm Peter Cardwell. You're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Peter Cardwell. You're with Talk TV. China is accused of a malign attack on Britain's democratic institutions with fears it hacked the details of 40 million voters. Well, joining me now to unpick this is the former military intelligence officer, Philip Ingram. Philip, thank you for joining me on this. How worried should we be about this? And I suppose the whole matter of our relationship with China, economic, political, security, is brought up when these things rear their head. We should be very worried about it. You know, China is gathering huge amounts of data on all of us by hacking into databases that they can exploit, by using and abusing data that is held in servers um, in, in China, and by traditional espionage techniques. And they're turning that round to then fire targeted disinformation at us to try and change the way we think about different things. Um, this is something that they're doing, not just the UK, but to um, everyone across the West. And that can be things, I mean, explain, you're the expert, explain to us about the kind of things that they are spreading disinformation about. I mean, we've heard uh, sort of from the sublime to the, the important, but less important for the future of our country and things like uh, the Princess of Wales and thing, destabilize, attempting to destabilise the monarchy. But when it comes to politics, which I want to concentrate just at the minute, I mean, how worried should we be? We're in an election year, three quarters of the democratic world is going to the polls. This is something that China, which is not a democracy, is going to focus on. Well, we have over 60 elections across the globe this year, including your EU elections, at least two sets of elections, UK local elections and, and the parliamentary elections. We've, of course, got the US elections. Um, and what China will be trying to do is create as much disruption around the West as possible. Because if you put it into context as to what China is trying to do, it's trying to position itself to grow economically. So if it can cause economic distress around um, other countries around the world, it looks for opportunities. And it's a very opportunistic um, nation, and it, it will try and exploit those opportunities. So create discourse, look for an opportunity, and then exploit that economically. But it's also got territorial ambitions as well. We see Chinese vessels um, in and around Philippines waters um, creating havoc and trying to stop the uh, Philippines um, Coast Guard and Philippines Navy from operating in there. We see China trying to stop the international community from sending its warships through international waters in the Paracel and Spratly Islands in Southeast Asia. Um, and we see China's aggressiveness against Taiwan. You, from a longer term perspective, I know we've got conflicts in Europe with Russia, Ukraine. We've got the Middle East brewing up. But from a longer term perspective, China is a bigger threat. It's so sophisticated. It's so multifaceted, uh, Philip. How on earth can we fight back against it? The, the biggest way of fighting back against it is awareness. You know, awareness that they are gathering um, information, that they could be abusing that information and sending it back to us again. The, the, the genie is out of the bottle. It's virtually impossible to put it back into the bottle again. So what we have to do is limit what it can achieve and we can only do that by awareness and by activity it's no accident that it's miss queen elizabeth her first operational deployment was done into um southeast asia um, and into waters that china is disputing um you at least the government is beginning to recognize that um, and international governments beginning to recognize the potential threat that's out of china we've seen some of the um, uh, the impositions that have been put on the utilization of Chinese technology in our 5G networks and elsewhere. And we see the debate that's going on about Chinese social media apps such as TikTok and uh, you're questioning whether they are actually video sharing platforms or huge influence platforms and intelligence gathering platforms. And they are probably all three. I can understand, and I think a lot of people can understand why they, the Chinese would want access to the voter rule, for example. That, that is something that we condemn it, we think it's awful, it shouldn't happen, but we can understand it. Why on earth does China really care about putting out disinformation about the Princess of Wales, for example? Why would they do that? Because it creates discourse, and there's, there's a wider group that there is here um, coming together, and we're seeing China working with you know, other international partners, North Korea, Iran and Russia, and Russia is very good at this as well. So they're all feeding off each other. Um, and China is the sort of the, the quiet sleeping partner in the background, but the one with you know, access to all of the capabilities and all, all of the money that's helping to do things. Anything that causes discourse, there's the old Chinese proverb of, proverb of death by a thousand cuts. So if you do lots of little things the whole way through, nothing in itself mm. in isolation is gonna create 
um, you know, something that's going to come back on China again. But put them all together and you're getting that political hiatus, you're getting that confusion, you're getting people focused on things that are not important um, or that they shouldn't be focused on. You're creating discourse. That tis discourse gives China an opportunity to try and exploit it. And the, the primarily they want to exploit it from an economic perspective. I want to ask you about Russia, Philip, as well, because we've had this absolutely horrendous attack, 133 people dying in the massacre in Moscow. At a, uh, there were lots of echoes of the Bataclan attack in Paris as well. But, I mean, it's just some of the video, some of the uh, details of what has happened. So many people injured as well. Um, the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, has warned the UK should be concerned about the threat of Islamic State as well. Just explain to us a little bit about, 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 about Islamic State, which have claimed responsibility for this attack and their role in Russia. Well, we, we should be concerned. And France has just put its, um, uh, it, its warning up to the highest possible level. So that usually means that there is intelligence suggesting that an attack is imminent. Um, Russia has got a history of um, upsetting the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda and, and, and elsewhere. You know, of, we, we have to remember that a Russian aircraft was attacked um, flying out of Egypt in uh, 20, 2015, where 224 people lost their lives when an Islamic State bomb went off. In, in 2017, um, in St. Petersburg Metro, there was the Islamic State um, detonated a device that killed 15 people. Russia is working with Bashar al-Assad in Syria, and they are attacking um, the Islamic State strongholds that, that there are there. So Russia and Islamic State are um, sworn enemies. And therefore, you know, they have been in the target list for quite some time. The Americans gave the Russians a warning two weeks ago. The Americans got their timing slightly wrong. They thought the attack was going to be um, you know, uh, uh, over the weekend a couple of weeks ago. But, it, but the detail in there was clearly accurate because they said you know, an area of, of, of public gathering and they stopped or, or, or put a message out to say to Americans, don't go to concerts and, and other things. So... You know, Russia has got its focus on what's going on inside Ukraine, and therefore Islamic State has taken mm -hmm. an opportunity to exploit the fact that Russia's security services are not necessarily focused on them as much as they potentially should have been, and the fact that they have, even though they were given a warning, they, they mistrust the Americans, so that oh, gave on, them a bit of a note, open actually, door. Philip, just mentioning Ukraine, of course, uh, President Putin has announced a day of national mourning because of this horrendous terrorist attack. Uh, he also made a, a bit more than a hint, I think, that Ukraine might be, have been involved in some way. Obviously, that plays into his political strategy and so on. But in this address to the nation, is that just, is that just from him disinformation in that regard? Well, the, the Russians have got a doctrine called Maskarovka, which is all about masking. It's all about throwing doubt out there. So he's he's talking to his domestic audience, having just been re-elected. We've seen the announcements of him growing um, his military by two armies worth. That's a that's a huge number. Um, we will we will see in coming days announcements of you know, increased mobilization of of turning Russian industries into more defense focused industries as he moves towards more of a total war footing and and then to try and explain the economic shock that there is going across Russia. So it suits him to blame Ukraine in some way for this, but it's you know there, there, there's no way would Ukraine do this sort of thing because it it would play totally against. Um, what they're getting from support from the, from the West and elsewhere. And the Americans wouldn't have put a warning out if there was any indications that Ukraine had been involved in it in the first place. Sure. Philip Ingram, uh, former military intelligence officer, I always learn so much talking to you. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. Candace, there's, there's lots in what Philip said there, but this uh, campaign of disinformation in so many ways from China is something we really need to worry about, isn't it? It is, though I do wonder, can we be endlessly manipulated? Mm. I mean, what you want in a free society is for people to be able to express their opinions and it, in such a way that the truth will eventually emerge. Um, Crit critical thinking, yes, but also there are some things that are just true. Of course. That people sometimes don't actually accept, like yeah. the fact that Kate Middleton was sitting on a bench telling us the truth. Well, what you, what you would hope is, is that the people who say things like that become completely discredited. That, you know, we look at them and we think, you got that really badly wrong. Yeah. And that's what you would hope for. I mean, you certainly, with all these troll accounts. I mean, they just end up in little silos. But people in the mainstream need to acknowledge when they get it wrong too. I think you're right, Candice. Thank you very, very much indeed. We'll continue to talk about this because coming up in the next hour, more on China's apparent uh, hack attack and an agreement that could see Israel releasing around 800 prisoners in exchange for 40 civilians kidnapped by the terror group Hamas on the 7th of October. I'm Peter Cardwell. You're with Talk TV.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22, mm. we was supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon, I'm Peter Carville. You're watching and listening to Talk TV. Coming up this hour, China is accused of a malign attack on Britain's democratic institutions with fears that hacked the details of 40 million voters. Israel is considering releasing up to 800 Palestinian prisoners, including killers, in exchange for the release of 40 Israelis kidnapped by Hamas terrorists on the 7th of October. And could bullying really pay off, according to a five-decade-long study? Children who display aggressive behaviour, such as bullying or temper outbursts, are likely to earn more by middle age. You can give us a call on your thoughts on this or anything else. 0344 499 1000. You can text me 87222 with the word talk in your text or tweet me at Talk TV on X. But first, let's get the news headlines. Divya Coley has them. Good afternoon. Four men have been charged with terrorism in Russia following a concert hall attack that killed 137 people. Three of the men were marched into a court in Moscow while a fourth was pushed in a wheelchair. Islamic State says it was behind the attack, something a former U.S. commander agrees with. This is not something that they just popped onto the scene. The U.S. and U.K. provided warnings to Russia uh, back a couple of weeks ago of possible terrorist attacks. So to me, these kind of things give more credibility to ISIS-K's claim that they are, in fact, responsible. 
MPs are set to be briefed about the cyber threat posed by China, as well as direct threats against some of them. Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden is expected to later outline details of a data leak involving 40 million voters last year. Former chair of the Defence Select Committee, Tobias Elwoods, told Talk TV, we must work with our allies before it's too late. We've all got to do the same thing. Otherwise, China is able to exploit the differences that we have. And that is the big challenge that we face. We need a China strategy. We need to recognize that this is China's century, that uh, in the next few decades, it could easily challenge or indeed overtake the United States militarily, economically, technologically as well. The Home Office has launched a social media campaign in Vietnam to deter migrants from coming to the UK illegally. The campaign will use adverts on Facebook and YouTube to target people who may be considering making illegal journeys to the UK. An increasing proportion of small boat migrants are Vietnamese. A man's been arrested on suspicion of murder at Heathrow Airport just hours after a man was hit by a car and killed in East London. The Metropolitan Police says officers were called to reports of a crash in Newham yesterday, where a 35-year-old was found injured at the scene. It's emerged Britain's leading universities now get most of their fees from foreign students as they become increasingly reliant on overseas money to stay afloat. Dozens of unis, including Oxford and Cambridge, only get a minority of their income from British students, with some getting more than three quarters of their fees from abroad. Universities insist the ability to attract rising numbers from overseas is a sign of success. And top scientists in Switzerland have announced they'll soon look into whether invisible ghost particles actually exist. Those behind the major project will hold experiments to look into the mystery of ghost particles, which could help us greatly advance our understanding of the true nature of the universe. They say their technology is a thousand times more sensitive than previous devices. That's the latest. Weather time now with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's looking pretty wet out there for this afternoon, particularly across northern areas of the UK. We started off with the rain out towards the west this morning and it's been steadily moving its way northwards across parts of the UK. Now, there's some heavy downpour still to be had, particularly later across parts of the west of England and Wales. And as that rain hits the colder air sitting across northern parts of Scotland, particularly into tonight, there will be some significant snowfall over the high ground of central and eastern Scotland. For parts of eastern England, though, I think it will just about stay dry this afternoon with some bright or sunny spells and with the uh, light southerly winds it will feel pretty mild but feeling cool elsewhere although temperatures around average for the time of year. Now overnight as I said that rain steadily moves its way further northwards across the higher elevations of central and eastern Scotland there could be as much as 20 centimetres of snow this could cause some tricky driving conditions for tomorrow morning. Elsewhere we're seeing rain across the uh, north of England over Ireland and Northern Ireland and some showery rain starting to push up tomorrow morning across central and southern parts of England as well as for Wales. But for northern and eastern England, I think we will see some sunny spells tomorrow afternoon and it should become drier and brighter for Scotland too. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good afternoon, welcome back. I'm Peter Cardwell. You're with Talk TV. Today we're asking about a new report which says there is now a dangerous climate of harassment and censorship. 76% of people told those putting the survey together that they're not expressing their opinion out of fear. Are you one of those people? Give us a call 0344 499 1000. You can text me on 87222 with talk in your message. Be sure just to put that word in your message or tweet us on X at Talk TV. Well, still with me to go through all of the day's top stories is the writer and commentator Candace Holdsworth. Candace, the big story today is really about China and the fact that they have this malign influence. They've accessed 40 million people's data. This is really, really worrying. They're also spreading slurs against the Princess of Wales. I know. You know, as Philip Ingram, Ingram said in, in the previous segment, what, what these bad actors will seek to do is to explore is div divisions. They'll find divisions. And there has been a lot of divisiveness yes. over the royal family online. You and it's got... growing as well. It's yes. not just on that. There's so many other issues as well. But on the royal family particularly, I mean, there are people even now saying 
completely falsely, by the way, just to be absolutely clear, that the uh, you know the, the video isn't right and the or wedding ring disappears and so on. I mean, some people just cannot recognise when something is really straightforward. You've got someone who is a very, very brave person dealing with uh, cancer treatment, dealing with uh, a very, very prominent public role, everyone having mm. an opinion on it, including us too, and uh, three young children, and uh, there are people just rubbing salt into that wound, and China and Russia spreading slurs and disinformation. Yes, and, and just to get into the psychology then of conspiracy theories, that's clearly not coming from a rational pl place. Yes. If you can be presented with very hard evidence like, like that, and you're still in denial, mm -hmm. then I think that that's, that's something else. You're invested in it for other reasons. Yes. I mean, I think that's one of the things that, that can be exploited on social media as well, is the fact that people do want to build up profiles online, mm -hmm. and they become part of a little silo in an echo chamber, and they're all just agreeing with each other. And that's a really negative incentive to have. I mean, that really pollutes public discourse because they're not interested in actually finding out the truth. They're not truth seekers. It's actually a kind of ego-boosting yeah. thing. And, and it's something almost medieval about it, the formation of these mobs. Yeah, I do, I do quite a lot of talks to young people and, and uh, sometimes journalism students as well. And I often say, you know, what's the newspaper or news source that you have some of them will put their hands up and say, you know, Daily Mail, but mostly it's on the more liberal side. I remember there, were, there was a class I spoke to, there were almost all of them talked about reading The Guardian every day. And I said, right, I'm gonna set you a task. You gotta read The Daily Telegraph three times a week, in the same way as I read The Guardian two or three times a week to find out what people who disagree yes. with me think and yeah. why they think it. It's really important. I think so. I think that that's that's something that in in this like in this in this information age that we live yeah. in, yeah, yeah. you know, we have to become so literate about the the, the wide landscape. It's of scary political for a lot discourse. of people as well. They just they just want to they I mean they want to to trust something in the media, and, and often we don't trust our politicians. Often, no. I mean, we're seeing in the polls as well that Reform UK, for example, are doing a lot better. They are beating the Conservatives in some constituencies and some of those. Uh, in some of those opinion polls, for example, they've had some electoral victories as well. Not quite the same percentages that UKIP and the Brexit Party have had previously, but reform are on the up. Yes, you know, it's, it's, it is. There's, there's a loss of trust in, in institutions. And I think that that's what Sarah Khan tried to say at the very beginning of the programme. I thought, I thought it was fascinating yes. what she was saying. Yeah. Really, really interesting. And she identified economic malaise as being a driver of a lot of this. You know, people are really struggling and they've lost faith in our leaders to deal with these sorts of things. Well, it is that, things. again, it's that trust where you say, you know, I might not know who you are, Rishi Sunak, but I'm, I'm investing my trust in you to run our country correctly and just so many things don't work, no. therefore people don't trust the state. No, they don't. And they're sort of looking for, for other options. You know, the worst is when it, it turns in, into negative things. Mm -hmm. I mean, where, I mean, the concept of truth means nothing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they, it's, it goes into things like the royal family are covering something up when they're clearly not. I mean, that is just a complete loss of trust beyond any rational and sort also of priv reasoning. And also privacy is an incredibly important thing and an incredibly well-guarded thing, especially if you're a royal and why should be. I don't want everybody to know. Anybody who says to me I don't care about privacy, I always say the same thing. Give me your phone and what's the code? Exactly. And maybe this is in this social media age as well. These are sort of values that we need to recapture. Yeah. We need to recapture the, you know, discretion, privacy. Mm -hmm. And I think in many ways Kate Middleton, which is why she's so well liked, embodies those values. Mm -hmm. She's a public figure, but she's also a very private figure. Yes, yes. And yes. it seems that she doesn't court fame as much as other people do. She's very happy to can't appear in public. Of, I can't think who you might be <laughs> referring to. Some, someone associated with the royal family in some way that would but court, we, court fame? Can't we struggle that with that. I think we struggle yeah. that, with that in our era. We sort of, we have a culture of celebrity which very much exists online. Mm -hmm. And when we see someone like that who is an icon in a public figure but who also wants privacy yeah, yeah, many yeah. people just can't accept that they can't come to terms with it's that a very very good point Candice thank you very much indeed um, we're going to talk about China now privacy uh, is a big issue of course in terms of so many people's data and uh, China is accused of a malign attack on Britain's democratic institutions that has apparently hacked the details of 40 million voters well joining me now to discuss this is the former Downing Street director of communications and senior advisor to Boris Johnson Gitto Harry uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. How worried are you about uh, China's malign attack, apparently, after the hack on the Electoral Commission? I think it's clearly uh, very worrying if anybody's interfering with the rules of the game, because if the rules of the game are compromised, then the outcome of the game is disputed, and then you undermine the whole basis of the legitimacy of, of government in the UK. So it's it's very serious indeed. Uh, I, I will say, though, Peter, that I think we do need 
uh, a sort of sense of reality and perspective about China. Um, we need to recognize that this is a major force for the rest of my life and the rest of all our lives uh, over the next few decades. And so uh, very well to express concerns when something like this happens. I've no doubt at all they are a serious threat and that they spy on us as we presumably spy on them. But it's the only conversation that we're having at the moment about China. Is this China the bogeyman has done something bad? Let's try and get back to where we were when David Cameron was prime minister in the early days when Boris Johnson was prime minister. Some of the things that uh, James Cleverly said when he was foreign secretary. We have to recognize the reality and deal with this major economy, this military power and this cultural influence on in our lives, frankly. I agree with you that we do need reality and perspective, but we also need values and we also need to say this far and no further. But it is, as you sort of intimate there, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, Gito, but we have to deal with China, don't we? We have to deal with them as a trading partner, as a diplomatic partner, and so on. But when they do things like this, when they do these huge hacks, when they spread disinformation, when they ban some of our MPs like Ian Duggan Smith, even our security minister, Tom Tuckenhat, from setting foot on Chinese soil, you can understand why people say, actually, maybe we should be a bit harsher with them. Absolutely. But the answer to that is to walk the walk, not talk the talk. And often, you know, the people who are sort of loudest and, you know, I'm not sure that Oliver Dowden is going to be that reassuring figure at the dispatch box this afternoon. I've met some of the people on the fringes of our uh, security services and they are far more reassuring, but they don't go out there and sort of poke the bear, if you like. They just try and work hard behind the scenes to make sure that our technology uh, catches up with this. They are frankly, technologically steaming ahead at the moment in China. And so what we need to do is a little less rhetoric, a lot more focusing on what we need to do to fund our security services properly, to make sure that we produce the right technical graduates, that it's worth their while, some of them, to go into uh, working for the country, not for working for private companies, and deal with this as grown-ups, not just lash out and sort of smash around with rhetoric. I think we've got to get back to being serious people at the moment uh, in public life. And uh, it's not helpful to me to sort of lash out in public against some sort of bogeyman. Let's let's match them. Let's outmaneuver them. Let's be cleverer than them diplomatically. And let's let let's get ahead of them technologically. You talked there about military intelligence, Skitto. You talked about uh, defence, and I wonder given that Grant Shapps, for example, and many other people within the defence establishment and other politicians have said that defence spending should be higher. We're not going to outspend China on defence spending, but as you say, a lot of defence spending and military intelligence uh, spending is not just about sort of tanks and planes, it's about people sitting behind desks and working in the cyber side as well, and that has to be a huge growth area. There's a line in uh, one of the recent Bond movies where... Um, you know, you know um, I can't remember his name now, but he basically says, I can do more damage in my pyjamas with a laptop than you can with your gun, Bond. Um, and, and, and that is true certainly at the moment. I'm not sure how often we're going to need a tank, but you can rest assured that cyber attacks, and uh, at the moment it looks like destabilizing, maybe prying, maybe spying, but there is the potential to using cyber attacks to actually shut down traffic lights, to render hospitals incapable of operating, to do enormous damage to the city of London. All of this is no longer the stuff of sci-fi and fantasy. And so if we were to take the threat properly seriously, we would be talking less and beavering away harder behind the scenes. And I'm not sure that the people who are beavering away behind the scenes and do manage uh, against the odds often enough to recruit the most exceptional graduates uh, to sacrifice, you know, the money they could make in the private sector in order to operate for king and country, that we need to give them the tools that are needed to stay ahead of the game. And this is always going to be a race. It's going to be dynamic. It's going to move on. We're never going to be able to rest on it. We've got to keep it up. But in the meantime, the politicians would be more helpful if they were trying to give China less reasons to laugh at us, not take us seriously, and to sort of perhaps feel more maligned towards us. You know, I think a little bit of good cop, bad cop. The politicians should be the good cop. Uh, let, the, uh, let the professionals do the work of keeping China properly technologically and in terms of espionage in check. One huge advantage we have over societies like China 
is free speech, is freedom of assembly, is being able to say what we think. But there's a fascinating report out today by Dame Sarah Khan, which I think may well have been commissioned actually when you were in government, or around that time anyway, Gitto, when you were advising Boris Johnson, which is about the fact that 76% of people, just one of the findings, 76% of people feel that they can't say what they really think. They're self-censoring, they're not putting their views out there. What do you make of that, which has come not as a result of, but nonetheless in the wake of the scandal and the uh, incredibly awful mob protests over the teacher at the Batley Grammar School who showed a picture of Muhammad? It's a really interesting piece of work, and it's a, it's a, a serious piece of work, and it recognises the nuances and the subtleties uh, that are often missing from the debate. So I think it's it's a great basis on which to proceed, because we can be simplistic on both sides. When you say I've got you know freedom, one of the great democratic freedoms is the freedom to protest, the freedom of assembly, and all that. So that needs to be protected. But none of these freedoms are absolute. And so your freedom or your right to assemble and your right to uh, protest should not include doing it in the immediate vicinity of a, a school where you intimidate people who are not uh, old enough to vote, um, not to mention any other considerations, children, with, with a sort of, you know, sort of very intimidating kind of view of the world. Now, this the origins of this, as you rightly say, it came because a teacher was trying to sort of intellectually engage children in the concept of blasphemy. What is blasphemous? What is not? Whether blasphemy can be uh, intellectually justified or not. And he showed a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad. Now, I call that intellectual exchange. I call that education. I call that training young minds. And you should be able to do that, not in other countries, if they choose to do things differently, Good luck to them. But it's part of our tradition that our freedom is the freedom to think different thoughts and to think outside the box. And what has happened now is that we do need to reassert the rules of the game, because if if the rules of the game means that we're uh, of the game means we're so tolerant that we allow people in who are intolerant, then there's a paradox there mm. that our tolerance leads to less tolerance because the intolerant people take advantage of our tolerance. Have you self-centred, Gitto? Have you sort of thought, I know you're someone not, not short of an opinion, but have there been times <laughs> where you have said, actually, I'm not going to put that on Twitter, I'm not going to say that in, a, in the context of a public meeting or in a workplace? Um, how, have, how have you been? Are you part of the 76%, I suppose? I'm sure that every single one of us, uh, you know, uh, now avoids saying some things that we may have said 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, Definitely. And in, in many cases, that's a good thing because there were different norms, you know, when I was at school and there were jokes that would be regarded as, you know, racist, misogynist, homophobic and all the rest of it now. And, um, you know, a lot of people uh, rightly had to sort of, you know, rein themselves in. But we all know people. And yeah, maybe we do sort of think, oh, I can't really say that. Um, and not saying things that are offensive, as in you're calling names or you're, you're, you're being rude about somebody else, but you're putting forward a point of view that is entirely legitimate, that other people can disagree with you over. But if you look at the trans debate, virtually everyone I've ever met is terrified of dipping their toe into any considerations there, even though it involves things like giving very, very radical drugs to you know, young people under the age of consent, under the, you know, in, in, in the mid-flow of puberty. There's been very little debate on that. There's been a change of policy recently, but most people have been scared of engaging in it. And that cannot be healthy in a democracy either. I totally agree, and we're going to talk about Scotland and its views on not just that issue, but on hate speech in general over the next day or two. Um, I just wonder if you could give me your thoughts as well politically on the fact that Reform UK are doing very well and in some constituencies are beating the Conservatives, certainly in the opinion polls anyway. Obviously, things will probably look uh, very different when it comes to the election in terms of how many seats Reform can actually win. But there's no doubt that they are doing much better than they were previously, and this is feeding in to the many, many problems problems the Conservative Party has. It is, but, you know, I'm very clear on this. You know, the Conservative leadership should, and I think do, worry a lot more about the fact that the Labour Party, by moving away from its extremes, is 
way ahead uh, of the Conservatives, not snapping at their heels, but 20 odd points ahead and reaching uh, towards, you know, what looks like a massive victory in the next general election. I don't think it needs to be like that. But the target should be, what is it that they are saying that makes people who obviously voted Conservative at the last election want to switch over to them, not look to the fringes that Labour has rightly moved away from and to think, how can we appease that 10, maybe 15 percent at a push out there? Because you head out to that fringe and you're leaving the centre of the pitch wide open and reform are not going to form the next government. I'm not sure that I can predict that much, but I would bet my house that reform will not be forming the next government in the United would Kingdom. Would you bet your so house that there won't be a... let's put them in perspective. Would you bet your house there won't be a Conservative recovery before the next election? Is there any way to turn things around or make things less bad? I mean, some people say the polls might narrow a little bit before the next election, or is this just terminal decline for Rishi Sunak's Conservatives? I think it's, it's almost very, very simple, and yet it's proving frustratingly elusive. In Rishi Sunak, though I have issues with the way he became leader, but we have a man who is clean living, hardworking, understands global finance, economics, and technology, the three biggest things that offer the main uh, opportunity for economic growth and the improvement of public services. And if he had behind him a united team, you know, determined to to take the game to the opposition, not to trip themselves off and be sent to the sin bin, then we would have more than a fighting chance of, you know, a decent uh, performance of the next election and maybe even, you know, deny victory to the other side or even scrape a win. What is not happening at the moment is that Rishi Sunak... Ugh, not not perfect, of course, and people around him. We can all always do better, you know, um, when you're on the inside. It's it's always hard. But the main issue and the main challenge for conservative sort of performance uh, worthy of the history of the party in the next election is the in, seemingly insatiable appetite of the Parliamentary Conservative Party to self-harm. And if they just get with the programme, support their leadership, give him a fighting chance and give the lineup that we have a fighting chance in the next election, then it's definitely not over. Gitu Hari, thank you very, very much indeed. Candice, quick reaction to what Gitu was saying about the Conservative Party. Is there any chance you think there'll be a narrowing in the polls that Rishi Sunak can get support from the people who are there? Because they really are, as he correctly says, tearing themselves apart. It's so true. That's their problem. A divided house cannot stand. I mean, this is what was Labour's problem for so many years. They were tearing themselves apart. And I think that this is what... Keir Starmer has really tried to do. He's tried to sort of get rid of the fringe lunatics. Mm. And as Gitto says, you can have an electoral strategy which tries to go for the centre ground, more than sort of fringe wedge issues. And maybe that is a more successful su successful strategy. Whereas I think the Conservatives at the moment are, are really tearing into each other over things like the Rwanda bill. Yeah. And it's more yeah. reflecting into Nissan's struggles within the Conservative Party, those two caucuses, the Liberal versus the right wing, mm -hmm. than actually maybe people in the wider country want to discuss. A very good point, uh, Candice. Thank you for that. We'll continue to debate that issue and indeed uh, the main one we're asking about today, which is this new report that says there is now a dangerous climate of harassment and censorship. 76% of people not expressing their opinion out of fear. Maybe you're one of them. Give us a call 0344 499 1000. You can text me on 87222 with the word talk in your message or get in touch at Talk TV. John's done that. He says, as I tell my children and staff, you should never get into trouble for telling the truth. Martin says, I've never been scared of speaking my mind. And Stephen says, our country is becoming a dictatorship. It all started during the pandemic. It's only going to get worse, he says. And uh, others have been giving us a call on the phones. Roy is one of them. He's in Northumberland. Roy, you're on the air. Thank you for the call this afternoon. What would you like to say? Yeah, hello, Peter. Hi, yeah. Uh, with regards to the report, uh, is this another example of a north-south divide? I appreciate the incident with the prophet was in West Yorkshire, but uh, throughout my 65 years living in the north of England, I can't say I've ever not said what I thought or been or spoken without or not spoken with an open mind. There, there is, there is maybe, maybe it's a cliche, but maybe it's a cliche because it's true that uh, people up north are uh, a bit more plain speaking. I think that's possibly true. I come from a background of public service. I have worked in agriculture as well. I frequently mix with people in the construction and building trade, and they certainly don't keep them thoughts to themselves about anything. 
I'd like to think I'm a reasonable person. I wouldn't say anything that deliberately upset people, but I wouldn't just agree with something or keep my mouth shut for fear of getting a brick through the window. So you don't think there's anything you really can't say? I mean, obviously, you want to be polite. You don't want to go around upsetting people for the sake of it, as you, as you say, but you, you, you feel pretty, pretty free to say things? Yes. Yeah, sometimes I'm accused of being too outspoken, but I, I consider that to be a positive thing. I think, I think there are the worse things to be accused of, Roy. Exactly. Um, as I say, I wouldn't want to upset anybody, yeah. but you've got to face the truth and be honest with people. You can't live a lie. It's a very, very good thought um, and a good one to end this section on. Thank you very much indeed. That's Roy in Northumberland. Appreciate his call, 0344 499 1000. Coming up, we're going to talk about Israel because it's considering releasing up to 800 Palestinian prisoners, including some killers, in exchange for the release of 40 Israeli Israelis who were kidnapped by Hamas terrorists on the 7th of October. I'm Peter Cardwell. You're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Worm <Where> is it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22, mm. we was supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Peter Cardwell. You're with Talk TV. Israel is considering releasing up to 800 Palestinian prisoners, including killers, in exchange for the release of 40 Israelis kidnapped by Hamas terrorists after that horrendous attack on the 7th of October, which has started what is going on at the moment in Israel and Gaza. Well, joining me now is Fleur Hassan Nahum, who's the Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem. Fleur, thank you for taking the time. Is this, Thank I mean, there, there's no reasonable nature to this at all. Those people shouldn't have been taken in the first place. There's been, I've done numerous interviews, horrendous detail coming out about how Hamas terrorists have used rape as a weapon of war. We don't know the condition of those who are still being held captive. 
800 Palestinian prisoners, some of them, uh, some of them killers. Do you think that this is, it's not a fair deal, but do you think this is a deal that will work? Well, first of all, it's Hamas who haven't accepted all the different deals being mediated by, by Qatar and by the United States. So we still don't even know whether they've accepted this deal. So that's the first hurdle. Secondly, we have a one-year-old baby in captivity with his mother and his four-year-old little brother, older brother. We have 18 women that we know are being ritually raped over there. What is a country supposed to do? Is it a fair deal for us? Absolutely not, but we have to do everything in our power to bring those innocent civilians home who were taken brutally from their homes one Saturday morning and the country has to do everything in its power to bring them back. So if that's the deal we need to cope with, then I personally think that we need to do everything to get them back at this point. Has everything been done though? Because there were uh, incidents where the, uh, there was one particular incident where there were uh, families of some of those hostages who stormed the Knesset saying that Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, hadn't done enough, hadn't met them as soon as they thought he should have and hadn't done enough to get those hostages back. Well, first of all, there were 250 hostages initially and 100 were brought home already in the initial deal that was done a few months back. So I think, honestly, politics aside, the government has tried to do everything in its power to get the hostages back. What I will say is that I'm in awe of the families of the hostages because I really do think that the campaign that they've managed have kept the hostages as the top priority of the war. And that wasn't a given. That wasn't a given. And so they've managed to keep their loved ones and the return of the hostages right as a top priority of the campaign and without them and without that public pressure, I'm not sure what would have happened the first round of the release and I'm not sure what would be happening today. How hopeful are you that all the hostages who are currently alive and we want them to be well and medically, obviously all of them will need medical attention. Some of them, as we know, are people who have had many, many medical problems that almost certainly aren't being treated properly by their Hamas terrorist captors. How confident are you that they will all come home? Well, they're not being treated. The Red Cross has not gone to see them. We don't even have proof of life. So what you're asking is an excellent question. Out of the 134, there is now, unfortunately, an estimate that around 30 may already be dead. Every day we hear news of who the army already assess. Uh, were perished on that terrible 7th of October. So we don't even know who's alive. Hamas have refused to give any proof of life. And this is part of the difficulty of these negotiations, that we're negotiating blind because mm -hmm. we don't know who it is that we're negotiating for. And so I pray that as, as many as 100 are still alive because we know that about 30 have been uh, killed. We know that from our own army assessment. So I pray as, as, as close to 100 are alive, but we have no idea. And I also don't understand why we're negotiating for 40 and not for the full 100. I want to ask you about aid, especially aid to Gaza and northern Gaza. Um, I was reading a report in the Guardian newspaper about this. And the second paragraph, I'm just going to read it to you. The United, Na United Na Nations Agency for Palestinian Refugees, UNRWA, UNRWA, said on Sunday, Israel has definitively barred it from making aid deliveries in northern Gaza where the threat of famine is highest. It gets to the 14th paragraph of what the Guardian uh, has written to mention the fact that UNRWA staff members have been accused, it says, of participating in the 7th of October attacks, call, and the agency has put, been called a front for Hamas. There's also evidence, which is not mentioned in the Guardian report at all, that the uh, logistical and technological uh, facilities that Hamas terrorists were using were underneath a hospital and that they were deliberately used there. So we're not getting the full story from The Guardian. We didn't get the full story from the BBC yesterday when this was reported. But nonetheless, there are people who will go hungry because that aid hasn't gone through. Tell us what is happening with that from your perspective, Fleur. So first of all, what do you going to expect from The Guardian who have shown their true colours and the BBC who won't even call a UK prescribed terrorist group a terrorist group? So let's start with that. We already know that they are biased uh, against Israel and pro-terrorists from the get-go. Um, let's talk a, a second about aid. 
And this is really what's incredible is we have the UN chief coming, standing on the Egyptian side of the border and complaining about Israel not letting enough aid in. So I wanna unpack that for a second. First of all, there is enough aid getting in and Israeli inspections, as you would expect, are there so that we know for sure there are no arms going in. So the problem does not start with the amount of aid. The problem starts with the distribution of that aid. Now, who is in charge of the distribution of the aid? The UN organization, UNRWA, the same organization that's, whose members are Hamas members, who we caught a teacher from the UNRWA schools taking and, and uh, keeping a hostage, basically being part of these uh, ca the captivity of innocent people. We know that about 14 of the workers of UNRWA took part on the massacre of October 7th. And we also know that their whole entire educational system teaches anti-Semitism, glorification of martyrs, and the complete denial that Israel should or does exist. So it's the same people who are completely incompetent for distributing aid, A, because they're incompetent, and B, because 60% of that aid is being stolen by terrorists. How terrorists do you deal with are that, shooting because, innocent, because I, terrorists I are shooting innocent, hungry people for daring to take the aid that is meant for them. And we have video evidence of that. I, 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 have no doubt, I have no doubt of that. I have no doubt of that, Fleur. How do you deal with that? Because there are many innocent civilians in Gaza, men, women, children, who just want to go about their daily lives, who want to have food, and there is real corruption in the system here. How does Israel, which is uh, obviously to many people in Gaza an aggressor, it, it, Hamas says, and we've got to be skeptical about these figures, that over 30,000 people have been killed, how do you deal with that and how do you actually distribute that aid and make sure that people who are totally innocent don't go hungry in a war situation? Well, first of all, we're not the aggressor. We didn't start this war. We're complete, we're, all we're trying to do is get our hostages back and dismantle the terrorist infrastructure that caused the worst massacre to Jewish people since the Holocaust. We didn't want this war. We didn't start this war. In fact, we thought we were in a new era with what's going on totally in Gaza correct. before totally October 7th. So that's the first thing. And secondly, what I think is incredibly ironic is that the UN is accusing Israel of not dealing with aid when they're standing on the Egyptian border. So I ask you, Egypt has a border with Gaza. Why aren't they helping? Why are they building more walls? And why is the entire responsibility of the aid situation in Gaza on the party that was attacked on October 7th. Why is Egypt, why has Egypt completely washed their hands from this situation? And why isn't the UN pressing Egypt to be a more active partner in helping the situation, also with the aid, and also with giving shelter to people until the end of the war? It's weird, isn't it? It's almost as if the Israeli government is under a lot more scrutiny than the Egyptian government. I wonder why that is. Um, just on Israel, they've announced new uh, settlements in the West Bank recently. Uh, it sometimes the Israeli government doesn't help itself, does it? I mean, that announcement and the fact that that may well be going ahead is not going to play well, is it? Well, if I believed that the blockage to peace was an extra settlement here, or an extra settlement there, then I would agree with you. But unfortunately, we had an existential war launched against us in 1948 when there were zero settlements, also in 1967, and a conflict in the 1950s with the Suez Canal when there was not one settlement. And this war really is, uh, and exactly the conflict is about much more than a kilometer here, because it's actually not a land conflict. Because if it was a land conflict, then October the 7th, you would see Hamas taking over a kibbutz, putting their flag and saying, we're not moving for here. This is a much more existential conflict. And it's really not about the fact that there isn't a Palestinian state in the West Bank or in Gaza, because we did left, leave Gaza. 94% of the West Bank is controlled by the Palestinian Authority. And the problem of this conflict is not that there isn't a Palestinian state. The problem of this conflict is that there's a Jewish state and the Palestinian leadership already for a hundred years cannot accept that fact.
Flora, thank you very much indeed. That's Flora Hassan Nahum, who is the Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem. Well, still with me is the writer and commentator, Candace Holdsworth. Um, this is just horrendous in terms of the number of people who can't get uh, aid, who can't mm -hmm. get food and water and basic supplies. And they are not being, and Israel's being blamed. It has a role here but Hamas is not helping either. Well, no, because they're trying to drag things out as long as possible and using the hostages to do that because they're hoping that Israel will just not be able to achieve their aim of eliminating Hamas. And they're going to have to give up on that. So even though the people of Gaza are suffering terribly, Hamas is not really coming to the table well, to end as this. As usual, they're using, Hamas are using their own people yeah. as a weapon. They do not care. They want people to die because they know that is a propaganda victory and that they can blame Israel for, uh, for, for killing them, actually, through this aid thing. Look, there's absolutely no doubt 30,000 people have been, uh, according to Hamas figures, which we've got to be sceptical about. But listen, I think we can agree tens of thousands of people have died in this uh, war. Israel has killed them. Uh, there have been uh, certainly... Um, men, women and children who shouldn't have died, yeah. who have. But nonetheless, we have to drill down a bit and get the truth here. And I just fear we're not, from many bits of the media, getting the truth about what is actually happening here. No, I don't think so. And, and the hostages always get forgotten. The fact yeah. that we are using, like she said, like Fleur Hassan, um, Fleur, um, Hassan Nahum said, is that these are babies that are being used as leverage. I mean, we actually have a family of a one-year-old and a four-year-old and their parents. I mean, we don't know what state they're in. We don't even know if they're still alive. They are being used by a militant organization to yeah. achieve its political aims. Yeah. I mean, that is so morally repugnant. It's heartless. It's totally heartless. It's, it's morally repugnant is absolutely right. Um, and, the, and the fact that I mean, I just don't want this war to happen. Nobody asked no. for it. We didn't. And actually, ironically, it was Jack Sullivan, the national security advisor, who said in the few weeks pre prior to the uh, 7th of October Hamas terrorist attacks that uh, that things were about as peaceful as they could be. And, and Fleur was, Fleur was uh, mentioning that as well. I know. Well, you had the Abraham Accords, which mm -hmm. was this historic moment where Israel was going to, to normalize relations with many countries in the Middle East. And this is why many people said Hamas did what they did. They wanted to disrupt that. Yeah. And I think in many ways, what's sad is they may have achieved that aim. Yeah, they're, they're not interested in peace. Hamas are not interested yeah. in peace. Candace, thank you very, very much indeed. Well, today uh, we're asking about a new report about here in the UK saying there is now a dangerous climate of harassment and censorship. 76% of people say they have not expressed their opinion out of fear. Are you one of those people? 03444991000. You can text me 87222 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Logan has been in touch and says, I am definitely concerned about this and the serious levels of dancing around topics I have to do. I think Logan's surname is perhaps not Roy. It's not the person from succession. He was never uh, in that drama, never uh, backward and coming forward. Louisa says the public sphere persecutes one side and there's no potential to push back in any meaningful way without the risk of criminal prosecution. Violet has been in touch as well and says if you want people to stop being afraid of speaking their mind, stop prosecuting them. Coming up, could bullying really pay off? According to a five decade long study, children who display aggressive behaviors such as bullying or temper outbursts are likely to earn more in middle age. I'm Peter Cardwell and we'll debate that next here on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, 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 treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kingdom City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking <laughs> and screaming. I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, absolutely. It was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Peter Cardwell. You're with Talk TV. Thanks to everybody who's been in touch, including on Twitter. Just read out a couple of tweets here. Rob says, what on earth did you just say? Israel is not the aggressor. That was a straightforward lie. Um, I'm not sure I did say that, Rob. I, I think I said, and Fleur, my guest as well, was saying that the 7th of October attacks were responded to by Israel and there was a period of relative calm uh, beforehand. Olive has been in touch. He says, why do these people imagine that China is the least bit interested in interfering with our already rigged elections? It's embarrassing, says Olive. I don't think our elections are rigged, actually. I think they're pretty free and fair, but you may disagree. Susan says, no surprise, any woman who has concerns about the attacks on our right to safe spaces from the gender ideology camp has been aware of this for ages. We read daily about academics being shut down, people losing their jobs with the mayor for Stadter and Joe Phoenix cases and so on. Certainly we've covered them in great depth here on uh, Talk TV as well. Robert say, I would always uh, say I believe in expressing my opinion, but sadly these days the police sometimes won't allow you to do so. Uh, regarding the China situation as well, Maisie has been in touch and says um, perhaps we should stop allowing thousands of Chinese students into our universities. Well, I don't think we blame the students necessarily. There are a lot of them, but I'm sure some of them are spies, but I'm sure the vast majority of them are people who just want to, to learn things. But uh, there are, um, I mean, um, that's a whole other debate actually, uh, Maisie, in regard to the fact that there are so many people who, uh, I mean, our, our university is one of the front pages today of the papers talking about the fact that Russell Group universities, the uh, top 20 universities in the country, are mostly paid for by foreign students. Another big, big issue. But let's talk about another one. Could bullying really pay off? According to a five decade long study, children who display aggressive behavior, such as bullying or temper outbursts, are likely to earn more in middle age. Well, I'm joined by the psychotherapist and broadcaster Lucy Beresford to look into this further. Uh, Lucy, thank you for joining me. Um, this is fascinating to say that bullies earn more. Um, I hate bullies and I've certainly been bullied um, in, in the past, as I'm sure many, many people have. We all know there are pe people probably in every workplace who are too aggressive. Um, tell me what you think of this study. Well, I wasn't surprised by the findings. When I'm asked to comment on workplace issues or I'm asked to describe things that are happening in an organisation, for example, I often revert to the language of the playground because what often gets played out amongst adults is something that's really recognisable from what happens uh, when children are younger. And that's because we're very primitive creatures. We have very base instincts and most of society is designed to try to smooth a lot of those baser instincts out. But when you've got classrooms the size that we have them, it's very hard to clamp down on bullying. And of course, social media has really amplified the ways in which bullying can be perpetuated. So it's no surprise that actually, because bullying isn't really stamped out in schools, that you actually see it happening within the workplace. And very unfortunately, those very skills that will 
um, see you rise to the top, uh, being very assertive, being uh, being full of very uh, big self belief. Although a lot of bullies are actually very insecure, but they mask that with a, a veneer of self belief. Those are the traits that will actually do you well in the long run in the workplace. And if doing well is about being promoted and having a great remuneration package, stands to reason that if you have those traits, you're going to be well rewarded. So bullying pays quite literally. What I don't know is whether it's going to continue like that, because it's very interesting that this study stopped in 2016. It was a very detailed study, as you say, over five decades, which is brilliant. But I've already noticed that the world of work is changing and the tolerance levels that, for example, Generation Z have for practices within the workplace, which one might uh, perhaps uh, characterise as being on the bullying side. I think there's a generation coming up behind us who are not going to tolerate certain things. We already see that there's a lot of resistance to actually being in the workplace in general, and that has been ridiculed. Uh, for example, they've been described as the snowflake generation, unable to deal with the workplace. Well, maybe, what, maybe what's happening is that they're voting with their feet and they're saying some of this behaviour that takes place within the workplace is shameful and I don't want to have any part of it. Although some of that, of course, is to do with dynamics in regard to how many vacancies there are in the country and the fact that sometimes that generation can actually move a job if they're not happy. There's so many employers I talk to all the time who say, well, someone won't, won't even apply for a job unless they're allowed to work from home, for example, a whole other debate. But I just want to put something to you, Lucy, that has been sent to me on uh, on um, uh, WhatsApp, actually. You can WhatsApp to this station, 0344 499 1000. Uh, it's from Marion County Down. She says, the fact that bullies thrive and flourish in their careers is not surprising. Employers only pay lip service to anti-bullying dignity at work policies, but they actually do nothing to stamp out a culture of bullying. Perversely, they value uh, bullies because they sometimes get things done. That's part of it as well, isn't it? A lot of managers just want an easy life and are afraid to do the thing that's in their title, manage. And also the remuneration structure in a lot of workplaces tends to favour people who are very assertive, people who perhaps have different boundaries to the rest of us, people who really who are those with the power, the ones in control. But again, I do wonder how long that's actually going to last. You mentioned there that you got a WhatsApp. Uh, that's a new-ish form of communication. And it has hitherto meant that bosses can be in touch with their underlings 24 seven. But people are starting to push back on that. People are beginning to say, no, I need to set boundaries. They've changed the law in France, haven't they, Lucy? In the workplace culture. And I think that's going to change. I think the bully might be on the way out, but mm. unfortunately it still lives right now. They've actually changed the law in France in regard to uh, times where people can actually be contacted as, as employees. I wonder if there are parents watching perhaps and your kid, you know, the dreaded letter comes from the school or email and says you've got to come in because your kid has been bullying someone else, uh, a child. I mean, that would fill me with horror, although I'm not a parent. But maybe parents will say, well, actually, maybe maybe they're just standing up for themselves. Maybe they're just being assertive and those are the skills you need for life. And uh, maybe, maybe this is less to worry about than other things because they'll earn more money, as this study suggests. To, to be fair, that's partly what the report actually goes on to say. I think there has been an attempt to portray this finding as something positive, that actually we're almost in danger of losing the word about being a bully. Uh, because we're translating it into something more positive around being assertive and having the courage of your convictions. And for sure, we want to raise confident uh, and very bounded uh, children. We want them to go into life in general, not just the workplace, but to you know have a sense of who they are and uh, to not be trampled on by other people. But you also want to make sure that they're not doing that at the expense of others. And I think if you are a parent and you are going to get that kind of letter, it is still something that you need to talk to your children about because ultimately having uh, perhaps a psychopathology about not really caring what other people might think of you and always imagining that you're the right one and you have the power, that isn't ultimately the way to live. You might end up in your mid-40s with a fantastic career and great remuneration, but, but no you'll have no like friends you. and no one will like you. No, no one will like you. Um, Lucy, thank you very much indeed. That's Lucy Beresford, who's a psychotherapist and uh, broadcaster. So thank you for, to her for joining us. Candice, have you ever been bullied? No. You've never been bullied? <laughs> when you've got red hair, you either become a victim <laughs> or you become tough. Okay? Right, OK. So there we go. Okay. But also, my best friend at school, I also think everyone was absolutely terrified of her. Right. So I just had her.
her, really. You know, one would have messed with me because they wouldn't want to mess with her. Imagine, I mean, you, you have young children. <laughs> it would be horrifying if, if, if they were either bullied or were being yes. or bullying other children. How would you deal with that? That's the thing. What, but you made an interesting point. I think a lot of people worry about their children being bullied, mm -hmm. but they never think about their child being no, cause bullied. No, because they're... they're <laughs> their, their children could do could do no harm. They yes. were always perfect little puppets who would never dream of uh, bullying another child. No, they're just getting blamed for things, you know? Mm -hmm. I do think, though, I genuinely do think there is a difference between being aggressive and being assertive. Yeah. And I think it's actually something really important that you have to teach children. Don't browbeat others. Don't try and cow them into submission yes. or control them. Assert your viewpoint, but also respect other people's the boundaries as well. The art of persuasion, perhaps. Candice, thank you very much indeed, Candice. Holdsworth there. That's all we have time for today. I'll be back tomorrow. Up next, Kevin O'Sullivan and Alex uh, Phillips are here with Crosstalk. This is Talk TV. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for your company. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. floor.